January the 1st of 1998. I'll introduce the entire zoning code and make it part of today's record. The Metro Code requires a record of these proceedings. Because BZA meetings are recorded for the Metro Nashville network, it's imperative that anyone addressing the board come forward to one of the microphones, introduce yourself by name and address, and only then make the desired presentation to the board. No comments from the gallery will be considered by the board, nor will they be part of the board's record. The Metro Code requires four members of our seven-member board in order to establish quorum. And the code also requires at least four affirmative votes in order to grant an appeal. Because our board has exactly four members present today, for all four of the members must vote in support of a motion in order for that motion to be granted. Pursuant to board rules, an aggrieved party may appeal board decisions to the Chancery Court within 60 days of the hearing date. Additionally, aggrieved parties may file a motion for rehearing if they meet all of the conditions under the board's rules of procedure, also within 60 days of the original hearing date. After that time elapses, the board's action becomes final. No further action can be taken. For the appellants, if your appeal is granted, you are in fact required to obtain the permit for which you applied. A permit must be obtained within two years in order for a board's approval to remain valid. After such time, you would have to begin the process again with a new appeal to the Board of Zoning Appeals. It should also be noted that if any false or misleading testimony is presented to the board, any board action could be revoked at a later date by means of a show cause hearing before the BZA. With that, Mr. Chairman, I submit that all the cases have been filed in the proper order, all appellants have been notified by certified mail, and all legal notice requirements have been met for today's proceedings. We have a few preliminary announcements here at the outset of the meeting involving uh, a certain reduction to our docket, namely with a couple of deferred and withdrawn cases. First, case number 2018-480 involving the property at 1301 Porter has been withdrawn by the appellant. Case 2018-501 involving the property at 1414 Dickerson Pike has been deferred one meeting to November the 1st. Case number 2018-560, that's 2018-560, involving the property at 3134 Dickerson Pike has been deferred. Case 2018-566, involving the property <clears throat> at 1506 Church Street has been deferred, one meeting to November the 1st. And finally, the first of the short-term rental cases, 2018-514, uh, involving the property at 1067B, 2nd Avenue South, has been deferred one meeting to November the 1st. For members of the audience, if you're here on one of those cases, 480, 501, 560, 566, or 514, those cases will not be heard today. Our board utilizes a consent agenda. One board member reviews the record for each case prior to today's hearings and determines any such cases where the appellants have met the criteria for their requested action. If the reviewing board member determines that the testimony in the case would not alter the material facts, then that case is recommended to the board for approval here at the outset of the meeting. We'll enter into the record those cases that have been so recommended, and for members of the public, if anyone is here in opposition to one of the cases identified for our consent agenda, please signify by raising your hand as I announce that case. Make sure that we see you so that we can hear the case in its regular order. Mr. Chairman, here are the cases that have been recommended for the consent agenda. First, case 2018-507, involving the property at 614 Garfield Street. Next, 2018-537. Oh, John Michael, one in opposition. An announce if there's any opposition. <coughs> Apologies. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 507 involving the property at 614 Garfield Street? Seeing none. The next case recommended is 2018-537 <coughs> involving the property at 2615 Grandview Avenue. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 537? Next, case 2018-546, involving the property at 1064 East Trinity Lane. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 546? Next, case 2018-547, involving the adjoining property at 1060 East Trinity Lane. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 547? 
And third, in the next sequence with those properties, that's case 2018-548, involving the property at 1056 East Trinity Lane. Is there anyone here in opposition to case, 10, uh, case 548? <laughs> next case identified for the proposed consent agenda is case 2018-554. That involves the property at 161 Rosa L. Parks Boulevard downtown. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 554? The next case recommended for consent agenda is 2018-558, involving the property at 119 Osceola Avenue. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 558? Finally, the last case recommended for consent agenda is 2018-563, involving the property at 906 Albert Court. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 563? And Mr. Chairman, I spoke too soon. There was one other on the list. Apologies for missing that. I believe that was case 2018-565 involving the property at 829 Lishy Avenue in East Nashville. Also recommended for consent agenda. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 565? There is, John Michael. There is. Very well. We'll pull that one off and hear it in its regular order. So to recap, Mr. Chairman, the proposed consent agenda is case 507, case 537, Cases 546, 547, and 548. Case 554, case 558, and case 563. We would solicit a motion from the board. We have it. Okay. We got it. I think there's. I think there's. Okay. You made the motion, right? Um, um, the uh, move that the following items be moved to the consent agenda. Is there a second? Second. Motion has been made and properly seconded. Any discussion about the consent agenda? Seeing none, all those in favor of the consent agenda signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes. John Michael. Mr. Chairman, we always like to use this opportunity at the beginning of our meeting to recognize any elected officials who are in attendance. Today, we're joined by Councilmember Bill Pridemore from the Madison area. Councilman Pridemore, would you like to address the board here at the outside of the meeting? Uh, I'll defer until the, the case is called. Until the case is called. And Very Council, well. Councilman Hall is here from the first district where I grew up. Hiding in the back. Councilman Hall, did you wish to address the board? Very well. We'll hear from Councilman Hall later in the meeting, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the help. With that, we'll get set up to make the first presentation to the board. Oh, we can, the consent agenda folks can go, right? That's right. Uh, for those who are here with cases that were approved on the consent agenda, for the appellants or those who had been here in support, you're done. You're approved. You can see the code staff, specifically the zoning examiners, as early as Monday morning in order to complete the process of pursuing your uh, permits. Mr. Chairman, the first case from our docket that is not recommended for uh, either deferral, withdrawal, or consent is actually case 2018-504 involving the property at 2030 Rosa L. Parks Boulevard. The appellants have asked if we could kick that to the heel of the docket. A council member Hastings has expressed an interest in coming and participating in the hearing, okay, but we'll be good. able to be here until a little bit later. So okay. we'll move that to the heel if that's okay. Absolutely. And when Councilman Hastings shows up, we'll hear the case. <laughs> With that, the next case that we'll present is case 2018-545. Margaret Parrish is the appellant, and uh, Charles Rogers Holmes, the owner of the property, located at 1315 Ote Street in Council District Number 7. The request is for a variance from the sidewalk requirements for the corner lot shown here at Ote and Scott. Uh, this uh, request comes in conjunction with a proposal for a new duplex construction. Ariel here gives you a sense of the layout in that neighborhood. From the recent site visit from staff, you see the face of the property there in the lower right-hand corner, the view across the street in the upper left, and the view up and down the street here. If we can invite the appellant forward at this point, Margaret Parrish is the named appellant for the case. I believe you have a recently submitted letter in your case file from the district council member, Anthony Davis, indicating his support of the request. Um, Ms. Parrish. 
Please come forward, have a seat at the front, and address the board. Good afternoon. Please state your name and address for the record, and why are we here? Oh, can we wait to see if the microphone's working? Is their both microphones not working? Okay. Please. My, uh, my name is Margaret Parrish. My, my address is 3284 K Harbor, 37214, but the property uh, on Otay Street is 1315 Otay Street. Okay. So what do you plan on doing? We have a, um, you want to build a duplex, and we do have a, a letter from your council person, Anthony Davis, in support of this request. Um, so you're here to get out of the sidewalk requirement. Yes, and, and if I have to contribute, that's fine because uh, I need to sell the property uh, and close the state out. You're so. here to ask us to... I know. Okay. And I, th I think that you, we, we've, we have heard this before, right? Is that you have been here before? I, I do remember that. Two weeks that. ago. Two That's weeks right. Ago. I, okay. Yeah, would, <laughs> it seems like forever ago, but it, it has only been two weeks. I, I, yeah, two weeks. Well, and we talked about you know about since you have you are do have a corner lot, and uh, we we do look at corners sometimes uh, differently. Um, so we have this letter from the council person, and we have in the past, if a council person comes to us and says, you know. This person should not have to pay for the sidewalks. You know, that's good enough for me. I typically defer to the council person on the sidewalk. Are we are, 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 are we done? Oh no, I'm just we're, hearing or? no, we're still talking. Oh, so any questions for the applicant? Okay, let's close the public hearing. We do have a letter of opposition in the file, and I think this gentleman appeared at our hearing last time. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm, I have no issue with the variance on Scott. Um, you know, I, and I do, I mean, I do appreciate the, the letter from the council member, and, and I do think that carries a lot of weight. But it also seems like that the cases that started to gel that way were. I, I, I want us to make sure we're reasonably consistent too, and so I, I, there's something about just you know, like I said, I, I don't have an issue with the Scott side. It's a corner lot, and I don't think people should be penalized that way. And okay. if there are other reasons for Ote, sure, I'm, I'm willing just, to hear it, but I'm, well, I'm not there yet. Do you have a motion? Um, well, I'd be willing to uh, grant the sidewalk variance for Scott Avenue. Um, and then ask that the, um, provided that the duplex doesn't have one of the homes facing Scott Avenue, because um, we don't have a site plan yet. I know the applicant's trying to sell the house, but um, the option is there for uh, only paying into the fund or building on Ote Street. Okay, motion's been made, is there a second? I second. Oh, motion to be properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes. Good luck. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. I'm okay. I'm okay. So you got, yeah, you got yep. the variance for Scott, but they have to do something on OTAs. You got about half your half property. Half of it. Okay. 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 Thank John, you. John Michael. Mr. Chairman, the next case we'll present to the board is 2018-550 involving the property at 807 Brook Hollow Road in Council District Number 23, shown here on the zoning map, shown here on the aerial. The request is for a variance from sidewalk requirements in an RS40 zoning district in conjunction with a residential construction project. Site plan submitted here gives you some idea of the proposed layout. From the recent site visit by staff, construction well underway. View up and down Brook Hollow at this point gives you an idea of the neighborhood as it exists vis-a-vis -vis no sidewalks presently. The appellant is Ryan Hinkle on behalf of Lawrence and Davis Properties LLC, owners of the property. If the appellant will come forward at this time, make the presentation. Uh, is there anyone here in opposition to case number 550? Five, five, don't have an appellant. 
In the we absence have an of opposition, in the absence of an appellant, it's perhaps a quick decision for the board. You can either defer this to a later date. I believe this is the first setting for this case. However, the board is always vested with the authority to dismiss an appeal if they wish. Board members? I'll move that we defer uh, one meeting. Yep. Okay, motion's been made to defer. Is there a second? I'll second. Motion's been made and properly second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes. Hopefully they'll show up next time. With lightning efficiency, the board moves on to case 2018-551 involving the property located at 1211 North 14th Street, shown here on the zoning map, basically at the corner of McKinney and 14th and Council District Number 6. Shown here on the aerial in its current state, and the site plan submitted gives you some idea. The proposal is to construct a detached accessory dwelling unit, or DADU, <coughs> as it's frequently referred to, um, but also to receive variances from two of the specifically uh, identified conditions. This is a permitted with conditions use under the zoning code, and the two conditions at issue are from 1716030. It's G is the section of that law that deals with DADUs. Specifically, 3B requires you have to have the same owner from the primary residence shown here on the left in the site plan to the rear structure or accessory structure. The proposal is for a variance from that same ownership requirement such that this would function a little bit more like a traditional two-family lot and thus have separate ownership. The second variance request is under uh, section G3C is in CAT under that same section of the law. That, uh, that which requires that one of the two units be owner occupied. So the request is for two variances from those two specific pieces of law. Matt Millsap is the appellant on behalf of, uh, or actually, and the owner, both appellant and owner of the property, shown here. And then the view up and down the street there. If the appellant's present, please come forward at this time in order to present your case to the board. And, but it, the, the, they do exist, right? It, it's already built. It's my understanding it is not. You said it is not? Of note for the board, this is a property that is in one of the overlays that potentially allows day dues that do not allow HPRs or horizontal property regime construction. Uh, fortunately, we are joined by staff from Historic who could explain some of the particulars of this. It is the type of scenario that's come up before, although I don't believe we've had one of these cases at the board, at least not in the last five or six years, where there was the request for the DADU preceding uh, the construction in this scenario as an alternative to some of the other options that might have been there but for the overlay. With that, the board can, of course, hear from other staff members from other metro agencies, or if you'd rather, go ahead and hear from the appellant. Board members, who do you want to hear from first? I'd rather hear from the appellant so we know exactly what we're at, what they're asking, and then we can hear from staff if that okay. works. Uh, my name is Matt Millsap. I represent Tim Wilson, the owner of 1400 uh, McKinney. Uh, we are seeking a couple variances, I think, that were unnamed uh, in addition to the ones that were named. Uh, what is allowed in this zoning is an attached. Uh, what are the variances you're seeking that's not on our agenda? Allowing for a detached uh, HPR. John Michael, is that? Has that been noticed? Yes and no. Am I live? Um, the only two identified requests are the two that I outlined with regard to potential for separate ownership under G3B and then the um, owner-occupied status under G3C. The request for the detached structure is nothing that requires a variance under the zoning code. The request for a day due under those conditions is that would require a variance though. The has, has all those been properly noticed on our agenda? Only two things have been noticed, and they're the two that I identified to you in the presentation. Okay. So let's keep let's hear those two. Okay, well let's hear we're we're gonna only hear those two today then. Okay. Uh, well we're asking that it, it be granted, uh, the variance be granted in, in lieu of hardship of uh, two utility easements on the property, an AT and T easement and a uh, Nashville Electric. Uh, I mean, uh, so the hard, that's the hardship for that's the hardship for the variance. Yes, but I don't understand how that has anything to do with two people living on the property or separating your parcel. Yeah, there it may have been mis not included in the original appeal, so we may have to defer this to the next meeting. But the intention was to allow for a detached. Uh, uh, duplex on this property with the hardship being the utilities that cut the property in half. Are these I mean, overhead how is that, utilities? One is overhead and one is underground. One but is AT&T, one is NES. 
I mean, but you, you apply for a day do. So is that, are you building a day do or are you building a separate house? The, we're building a separate house. And now are you, yeah. I think we need to clean it up a little bit. There are a couple of uh, statutes we need to cite and, and uh, get it a little and cleaner. Naturally, staff would be happy to meet with Mr. Millsaps and his client to help them kind of clean up the request and be okay. a little more clear when we come forward. You do have staff from Historic here. If you wanted to hear from them now, since you are still on the record, you could hear from them. But if not, we can just go ahead and proceed. Let them defer to a later date and go from there. Well, I, I, I think that's, I mean, my opinion, I think that's fine to hear uh, quickly from historic because, frankly, I think that uh, at least now you may have more people at the, at the hearing uh, next time. There's only four, so you, you have to have my vote today. You don't may not have to have it next time, but, it, but I think you're going to have to um, at least address the issues that historic's raised uh, for me to support something, and, and, and they have some serious issues about it. So I wouldn't mind hearing at least quickly from Historic so that you'll know exactly what uh, issues that you're going to have to deal with and satisfy. Okay. As you're mentioning, I will not be at the next meeting. So oh, okay. Thank you. Hi, I'm Robin Ziegler. I'm the Historic Zoning Administrator for Metro Historic Zoning Commission. And board members, we have a letter from Ms. Siegler in our packet to us about this very project. Yes, thank you. Our main concern is just the process. Uh, to give you a little background, this uh, data ordinance was developed in 2012 <coughs> by our office with the assistance of the planning department, specifically for the historic overlays. At that time, you may remember duplexes had to be fully attached. So this was a way to have a detached second dwelling. And one of the ways we were able to get neighborhoods and council members to feel comfortable with that was with these requirements that it not be sold separately, separately and an owner live in one of the two units. And we certainly agree a lot has changed since 2012 and the Dadu ordinance itself has changed over time. Um, and that may not be the best tool anymore, uh, but if that's not the case, we would like to have that opportunity <coughs> to have that same process that we had in the beginning to involve council members, planning department, neighborhood leaders, have these discussions, figure out what's the best way, at least in historic overlays, to address the issue. And this is in, his, this is in a historic overlay, <coughs> yes. right? Yes, yes. Yeah. Every time I see a letter from you, I think, now why are we hearing this instead yes. of you guys? Because I know you all get most of the variances that, that we hear that are not in overlays. Um, and so, you know, I guess there's some confusion as to whether they'll call it a duplex or a day do. I think that was part of getting. Yeah, um, what, they re what they applied to us for was a dadu. Right. And what they would now like to request, my understanding is that it's a detached duplex. And would that come to us or would that still come to us or would it go back to historic? I'd Not to be glib, but neither. It, it would travel as a dadu application. Okay. And, and be permitted that way if these variances were granted. I think what both Ms. Eagle and I are struggling to kind of find the exact right way to phrase is that stripping away these conditions, thus giving a variance from those conditions, functionally makes it a second house in the tradition of a horizontal property regime to family development. Yep. And functionally, it's no longer a day do at that right. point. But it would be permitted nominally as a day do. Okay. Well, and we may be getting into to next time's questions, but I do think that that, that ultimately is the question is what what would what would the hardship what would a legitimate hardship be in your mind to allow this type of thing to happen and i i mean and i honestly don't know since it's an ownership question i don't know what a hardship would be it, it, you, it's, you can have a second dwelling unit now so i don't know that there's anything really I mean, they, they were, and that's what I had asked the applicant originally before we realized that we needed to, to clean it up. And, but that was, you know, the, the, the power lines, the utility lines, and all those things deal with the placement on the lot. They don't really deal with the ownership issue, which I think is the question that you're addressing. Okay. Uh, having the second owner is... Um, okay. okay. Any that, other uh, questions for staff of the Historic Zoning Commission? 
Thank you for being here. Thanks for coming. And I'll just add one quick little thing. We have received a grant from uh, the State Historic Preservation Office to um, look at this issue, among other things. So it is something that we'll be looking at over the next year. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So we're going to defer that till the next meeting. Okay. Does okay. so anyone have a motion to defer? I think the applicant's raising his hand. Oh, the app. Oh. I, I didn't know if you come, wanted, come forward, come forward. Sorry. I didn't know if you wanted me to clear up the, the issue of the hardship with the utility easement prevents us from having an attached. Right. Well, if we're going to defer the case, we'll, we can yeah. hear that next time. Great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Is there a motion to defer? I'll make a motion that we defer one meeting. Motion's been made. Is there a second? I'll second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Uh -huh. We're going to defer at one meeting. John Michael. Mr. Chairman, the next case the board will hear is 2018-552. This involves the property at 4188 Blueberry Hill Road in Council District Number 1. The request is for a variance from front <coughs> setback requirements in an agriculturally zoned district shown here, AR2A, which as you'll recall is Agricultural Residential Minimum Two Acre Lot Size, or AR2A. In conjunction with the request to place a second residence on the lot, or something that would be allowed under the law, the request is to reduce the front setback requirement from 40 feet down to 15 feet. Face of the property is shown here from a recent site visit by staff, view up and down the road there. The appellant is present. That's Mary Maloney and Chris Phillip, the appellant and owners of the property at that location. Please come forward at this time. Uh, is our opposition present for case number 552? There is. There is. You also have documents in your file from those who have written in regarding the property, and you also have the district council member present with regard to this and another case as well, I would assume. So we'll let you uh, hear from them whenever they're ready to present, and Mr. Chairman will let you drive that. Okay. Uh, does the council person want to speak first, or when do you want to speak on this case? Do you want to speak on this case? At, at the end. Okay. Please identify yourself for the record, your name, address, why you were here. My name is Chris Phillip. This is my wife, Mary Maloney Phillip. We live at 4184 Blueberry Hill Road. <clears throat> We've lived there for 10 years now. We're not developers. We're longtime residents and homeowners. We are reconstructing an 1800s era cabin on our property, the footprint of which is a meager 17 feet by 25 feet. We're requesting a front setback variation from 40 feet to 15 foot due to the following hardships. It's our position that our hardships are threefold. One, the topography of the land, <clears throat> especially as it pertains to septic fields and drainage, will only allow such field in certain locations on our property. Secondly, soil percolation conditions, which dictated acceptable locations of septic fields determined by the health department, have stated exactly where and how these fields can be located. Lastly, the desire to avoid losing any more materials <coughs> other than absolutely necessary. In order to reach a 40-foot setback, we would have to cut down an additional 15 to 25-foot more mature trees that simply will not grow back in our lifetime. We've included topographical and soil site maps to reference all of these points. <clears throat> Primarily, our hardship is dictated by site selection and septic field location. For septic suitability, we work closely with soil scientist and Scott Felwick from the health department. We are only allowed to install septic how and where soil scientists, surveyors, and Metro Health Department dictates. As a result, this is the best possible location for the cabin. All of these people took into consideration the location of existing septic fields, plus developing a new backup system for our primary residents. In addition, we've located a primary field for the new cabin, as well as a backup field for the new cabin. This takes up quite a bit of flat land. We also had to work around existing structures, including existing home, garage, existing water lines, two ponds, a well, driveway, existing water lines, as well as field use for agricultural. <clears throat> as far as precedent, as we know, precedent alone is not enough to receive a variance. Anyone who tries to develop at this point or in the future will also need to establish, establish a hardship as we are doing today. However, to illustrate the fact that we will not be setting a new precedent for the road, we've included maps for six out of the 19 houses on the road, 
establishing that one third of the homes built on Blueberry Hill have a variance to the setback required, being less than 40 foot to the property line. This includes the very first house on the road, 4010 Blueberry Hill Road, which is the exact same 15 foot setback that we are requesting. <clears throat> We have in included a copy of the original variance from 1994, where Mr. Gunlock presented the exact same hardships that we are presented today and was granted his setback variation by your council. In terms of support, we would like to note that there are only two property owners on Blueberry Hill who will drive by or have field division to the proposed site of the cabin. Owners Terry Knight and David Royce have submitted letters of support. And you say they're the only two because y'all are on a dead end street. They're are, the only two that the, are past you. We are at the absolute end of the okay. dead end road with this cabin site. Uh, we do have a couple people here for opposition. One, Noah Abrams, I would like to note that this is the furthest most point on our property from his property that we could possibly locate this cabin. Uh, the other source of opposition is 4010, which we've already stated they are the exact same setback we're asking for. Um, it seems to me that the two neighbors that can see it should have the most say, and they've both already written letters of support. Uh, we've also met with our councilman throughout this process. He has expressed his support as well. And uh, anything else? So tell me, uh, you know, 15 to, I, I, heard, I heard you, mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm going to ask you to basically repeat sure. it, but so I can understand it. Um, why 15 feet instead of 20? Uh, you know, why, why is 15 feet it? And then tell me that, and then tell me what you're going to use the, the cabin for. So if you'll, if you'll actually look on this map, you have number one and number two. Those are the two places that they say we can have our septic field. In order to gain a proper drainage into that septic field, 15 foot is where we can be. Um, like I said, we're not stating... We're not setting a precedent. This is already a, a firm precedent established by the first house on the road as right. well as one third of the houses. Um, as far as the intentions of the cabin, I've been working on this a couple years. Primarily, it's historical preservation. Secondarily, I think it's cool factor. Um, if I was doing this to make money, there's a million better, smarter, easier ways to make money than preserving a 17 by 25 foot cabin. Where's this cabin come from and what are you going to use it for? I think that's what he wanted to know. We're using it as an accessory dwelling on our property, whether it be family in town or game room or anything else we want to use it for. Have um, electricity? and uh, We already have electricity at the site. We already have a water tap approved for the site. We've included, We've included all this, by the way. The building permit and the water tap. Our okay. septic field's installed and approved. Everything's done. This is just an issue of 15 foot from the road or 40 foot from the road. And wh where did the cabin come from? Uh, we dismantled it um, out toward Pleasant View a couple okay. years ago, actually. it's uh, We've got all the documentation on it. Okay. In 1902, this was the original homestead on the 120 acre. I mean, it's a real piece of history. Wow. Other questions for the applicant before we hear from the opposition? OK, you'll have five minutes and 42 seconds for a rebuttal, and you'll come back after, you hear, after we hear from the opposition. So. Opposition, please come forward. You will have 10 minutes collectively. Um, that does not include any time that the... Have other people in support? Oh, yes, this is the time to... Yes, those in support of the application, please come forward. Who's here in support that wants to speak? Anyone? Is there anyone here that wants to speak in support? Okay, then we are going to hear from the opposition. Please come forward. State your name, address, and why you're opposed to Mr. this. Mr. Chair, Jim Murphy, 1600 Division Street. I represent Noah Abrams, the immediately adjoining neighbor who submitted a petition and letter in opposition. Uh, Mr. Phillip uh, mentioned the variance that was granted back in um, 1994, but uh, I'm going to pass around the actual uh, variance and the actual map that was approved back in 1994, which shows how small the piece of property it was. And it shows it's a 20 foot variance that was granted back in 1994, not a 15 foot variance. John, could you pass that up there to him? 
Uh, I'll also, also want to give you these topo maps. I have multiple copies of these. Uh, this case is about the fact that the applicant wants to put this uh, house, this cabin up near the street as opposed to putting it back near their house where their property is very flat and suitable for a dwelling. So there is no hardship other than the fact that they want to put the house close to the road because it gets it further away from their dwelling. And that's not a grounds for, that's not a, a sufficient grounds for a variance. Um, we have multiple neighbors along the street who are opposed to this uh, variance. Uh, the fact that they uh, drive, I mean, the applicant is citing this as a, I don't think my time is counting down, which oh. I typically don't complain about, <laughs> but since I've got another speaker, I don't want to, okay. I want to keep an eye on that. Um, okay. Continue, Mr. Murphy. Uh, thank you. Um, again, the neighbors here are concerned about what the applicant is now using as the precedent of a prior case to justify this variance. They're very concerned about the precedential effect of any variance on this street. And so therefore they're very opposed to this. Uh, they would contend that the, uh, that the uh, variance, I mean the uh, setbacks along the street, uh, my clients well uh, set back well more than 40 feet. And so from that reason, you know, from his standpoint, he's very concerned about it. Um, he's, he's gone through in, in detail in his letter why he's opposed. And so for those reasons, we would contend that this variance isn't warranted. Uh, there is not a hardship. The hardship is self-created because- How, the, how is it self-created? The applicant has decided where he wants to put the house and then said, well, I can't move it because I'll have to cut down trees and I'll have to- But uh, the mature trees are a well-established hardship by this I, board, I'm not so, arguing that. So, why, so tell me why is that not a hardship? Because that's the trees that he's complaining about are because he's putting this house up at the front of the property. If you look on the topo maps, there, there, are, there are many areas in the pictures that John Michael displayed, there are plenty of area in the rear around his dwelling where he could put a, this small cabin and not have to cut down any trees. And so for that- Just, And your, your argument is that he could do that and use the same uh, septic field? Correct. Okay. Correct. He could, he could use the same septic field. He could use, or he could put the septic field closer to the house, the, closer to his existing residence and still uh, and still meet the requirements for a, a septic field. So there's no, this is about a choice of putting this cabin further away from the house because they want it further away from the house. So I, and I, you may not know the answer, but uh, the question is, uh, and uh, because you raised the point that, um, and, and I don't know anything about septic fields, um, but how do you know he could put the septic field closer to the house? When, I mean, he, he's bringing us somebody that says, or he's... He's, he's bringing he's, you a plan that says this is a septic field for this dwelling, for this dwelling at this location. He's got, he's got an existing... That, that wasn't the testimony. The testimony was, these are the two places I can put a septic field, well, and, and he, he this also is could, where the dwelling has to go to, to drain into the septic field. He can also run a line from the house to the septic field in its current in its proposed location. So there's nothing that prevents him from connecting to the septic field other than the fact he wants to put it close to the house. And so that's... Yes, it, maybe that is the only location for a septic field, but you can pipe the septic to the field from the house at the appropriate location. And then, so I guess the other, the, the real question, I mean, and precedent, you know, I mean, we've always said, and you've been here enough to hear us say that, I mean, it, every case is unique. So uh, is, that the, is that the only worry that, you, I mean, that you'd mentioned that that was your main concern, your I client's think, main concern? I think there, there are concerns that at some point this road may need to be widened at some point if there's access to the park and the road needs to be widened and this house is close to the road, that's a concern for them. Uh, you know, that it's that's not the only concern of precedent, but that is one of the major concerns is that future development down the street will come in and want to do that. So. I'm going to uh, stop at this point so that the other folks who are here in opposition can speak, or, unless there's other questions. Any other questions for Mr. Murphy? Okay. Let's Thank hear you. from your other people in the opposition. 
please state your name, address, and why you're opposed to this. Uh, my name's Charles Gunlock. I am the first house, 4010 Blueberry Hill Road. I have a document from 1949 that proves that I have an existing variance to put a pre-existing structure back in the 20-foot offset and if you were to pull a proper tape measure from the offset the 10 foot offset i'm approximately 23 feet to my front porch my front porch is an additional five more feet stating i'm 28 feet from the road uh, i see no need for this this was predetermined st structure is not even existent uh, in 1997 Beeman Park in its infancy was trying to put a structure at the end of Blueberry Hill Road. 100% of people on Blueberry Hill Road at that time would not let them put a structure 15 feet off the road for tool storage, one vehicle to come to that point. For the same reasons he is supporting the hardship, people didn't want trees torn down. People didn't want extra traffic. Yes, I do live on the first rough part portion of this road, so that means all the traffic goes by my house where I have small children. Safety comes into a fact that we have a one-lane road. So two cars, one has to get off the road. So we add more traffic to this. I don't, I don't foresee that this is being safe. How, how are we adding more traffic? You're adding another residence. Right, that he said is for his his guest and his pool. That's what it said. That's his word against mine. So, I mean, but I'm, I mean, I'm, I've been on the road. I'm not trying to be argumentative. I'm saying, what is your word? Are you, you're saying he's going to use it for something he's not saying it is? Like that's your, that's your fear? Or your... That's the rumor. That's the fear. Okay. But this person also owns three other pieces of property. If we change this variance, the other topographic hardship falls on these other pieces of property that he owns that, are that they on, does that fall into his hardship are, again? Are they on Blueberry Hill yes, also? Sir. And recently we've had somebody purchase 30 acres directly across the street from me that has never been developed, been in a greenway for 36 years. And if this variance has changed, then I'm going to be looking across the street at all my mature trees and my view being destroyed. Approximately 8.19 acres dictates into 356,000 square feet. So he has put a hardship on himself for moving this to the furthest most part of his property to the closest point of the road. So you're telling me at 356,000 square feet, there's no other place to build this structure suitable to follow the setback and guidelines of what our community is already doing. Our community is based around modern e e e exterior stuff, not 1776 cabins that you want to stare at and all. We have structured roofs, we got brick, we got all man-made material, not stuff that sets with this cabin. This sounds like something you would put in your backyard where you can just walk out and enjoy it. So my question is, is why does it need to be showpieced at the front of the road demeaning my property value? How does it demean your property value? You're taking my house that's 2,000 square foot and putting a 817 by what did he say? So 17 that, by 25. So whatever that square footage comes out, 15 feet off the road, there's just all these. But it's 15 feet off the property line, so yours, you said you had an extra 8 feet. Yours is 20 feet off the property line and 28 from the road. So assuming his is 15 and also 8 feet from the road, it'd be 23. If you're comparing apples to that, I mean. He's it, asking for it to be setting in what he's the asking offset for a 15, is, 15 foot all. variance. And all we can, the only thing we can give a variance for is off the property line. So, I mean, I, I, we don't, I don't know where the road is. Uh, so if, if you're saying that you have eight feet between your property line and the road, then we're assuming... No, I've got, from my front porch, is 23 feet. That's not counting... To the uh, road. To the road. That's not counting the extra five of the porch. Okay. The porch is non-dwelling, so it can't count against you, so it's truly 28 feet from the no, road. No, the porch counts, so... Well... Yeah, the, I mean, the port, for a variance, the porch counts, so... Well, no, that's fine. So you're 23 feet from the road from the road right away. Okay. 
Okay, is there anybody else? Uh, any question, other questions for the opposition? Thank you. Thank you. It, Mr. Chair, it, I'd like to. I had a chance to review the package that was just submitted, and I would like to respond to a question Mr. Taylor made about the soils mapping. If you'll look at the drawing, the legend of the soils mapping, you'll notice that. Uh, can, which one is that? Sure, it's, sure. it's this one. Uh, that has a legend. <laughs> it's it has legend right in the middle of it. All right. Thank you. I want to I want to look at it. The same. Yeah, I, I want you to. I'm, I'm waiting wait until you get there. Yeah. Well, I hope you don't have to wait long. But it, is, it, is it this one? Yes. That looks like that's it. Yeah. Okay. If you look, there's two things I'd like to point out here that totally uh, destroy their argument. First, to the if that's north, and I don't see a north arrow, but to, if you look at the area that's kind of cross-hatched, which is the soil, soil map, the area they map the soils, uh, there is a noted cabin under construction right there uh, to the south of that, which would clearly be within the 40 feet uh, uh, you know, outside the 40 feet of the setback. So again, if they can build a cabin right there, uh, they can put this cabin right here. The second thing is their claim is that this is the only place they can put it because this is the only place where the soils would permit it. But if you look at their map, it shows the limits of soil mapping. So they only soil mapped right where they wanted to put this site. So if you'll see that, it shows an area highlighted in red, which is the limits of the soil map. So they didn't soil map towards the rear of the property. So they can't contend that they're not soils uh, adequate for a septic tank otherwise on the property because they didn't look anywhere else on the property. So their own drawings show that one, they could put the cabin back where this proposed cabin would be located and meet the 40 foot setback. And two, they don't have a soils problem over their entire property because they only mapped a very small portion of the property in the front. So for that reason, your honor, or your members of the board, uh, this variance is purely a self-created hardship and it should be denied. Thank you. Hey, any questions for Mr. Murphy? I, d I actually do have one. So you are saying that the limits of the soil mapping, well, how do we know that the other parts of the property can it's, be built? It's their burden to prove that they can't put, they can't put their septic tank anywhere else on their property. They're claiming that this drawing shows they have a hardship, but they've only they've only mapped a small portion of the property. So it's their burden to prove the hardship, not mine to prove that it's not. What about the topography for the rear part of the property? The topography map that I showed showed that the rear property is much flatter than the uh, property at the road. In fact, that's where their existing dwelling, their uh, bar, I mean, their garage, uh, their, uh, the residents in the garage are all back in the flat area of the property further away from the, from the street. So the, they've got a flat area <coughs> that wouldn't require um, them building on a steep slope, but they want to put the house up at the front where there is a steep slope, and that's what they're using as a justification for a hardship. So there's not... They've got plenty of room, and as I say, their own drawing shows it. They've got a cabin under construction um, <coughs> right next to that septic tank field, and that clearly is a sufficient place to put this proposed cabin. And they also have, if you'll see, um, right next to the septic field, a bus that is sitting on the property. It says, I think the note says, old school bus on blocks. Well, again, the old school bus on blocks is probably outside the 40 foot setback and could be, there's no reason they couldn't put the cabin where the old school bus on blocks would be. I mean, it's flat enough to put a school bus on the block. This is a really small cabin. So again, there's plenty of places to put this cabin on this property without having to get a variance. And so for that reason, there is no basis for this variance. Thank you. M Mr. Murphy? Yes. Is there any dispute that there are 19 houses on the road? 
I don't think there's a dispute that there's 19 houses on the road. I think there's a dispute as to how far away those houses are from the road. Okay. Do we question that six of the houses, as the applicant has alleged, are within the setback that he's seeking, are closer to the road than the setback he's seeking? Yes. I think I think there's clearly – I mean, he's claiming that the house where the variance was granted – was within 15 feet and in fact I've submitted the drawing from that site that shows it's 20 feet so it's clearly uh, there's clearly some error in his drawing also his drawing is based on uh, taking the uh, Metro GIS map and using the measuring tool well that's not an accurate measurement of anything and so there's no basis for saying that those houses are anywhere based on using the measuring tool on Metro's GIS map because for one thing Metro's GIS map doesn't accurately depict the location of the right-of-way so and so for that reason, the Metro GIS map measuring information is, is useless. No one would rely on that to determine the location of a setback. We, we can ask the applicant. What I heard him say was that they were, they were closer than 40 feet, feet not okay. the 15 feet That's he wanted. That's what I heard him say. And I'll have questions for the applicant based on what you right. brought out on the soil mapping. But I also question this is a dead-end street. We are talking about the property at the very end of the street, your client has no reason that I know of to circle down and go back. So I'm just, I want to make sure I understand his concern about property value uh, and how it affects him. Well, it's, it's different. It, number one, it's different from uh, his property, obviously, because he's, he's within the setback. So he's compliant. And so for that reason, that's one issue. The other issue is just its close proximity to the street creates a, a differing visual experience than what other, all the other homes in the neighborhood okay. would provide. So th those are their concerns. Okay. okay. Any other questions for Mr. Murphy? Okay. Anyone else in opposition? Okay, we're going to hear from the applicant again. This is rebuttal time. Please come forward, and you have five minutes and 46 seconds. Then after that, we're going to hear from the council person, but this is your time to rebut what you just heard from the opposition. Uh, there was a lot there. Um, first, let me say that we provided maps using the same measuring tool for all of the houses on the road, including our proposed site. So we are comparing apples to apples, in my opinion. There's a lot of opinions about where things get measured from, et cetera. So if anything's off, that's equally off is what you're saying. That's right. Okay. And, and we're trying to be really fair here. Um, as, far, as far as my rebuttal, the cabin is sitting there on site. You know, I took it down a couple years ago. I've dry stacked it to make sure I have what I thought I have before I've put the money in the investment and proceeded. So wait a minute. Um, this 17 by 20 feet, the cabin that he mentioned, that's the exact same cabin? It's actually 17 by 17 foot currently. It's going to need a small addition to accommodate a small bathroom. There was no plumbing in the 1800s. Okay. So the cabin is already located on your property? It's, and it's, it's not setting on a foundation. It's just sitting there. Uh, why can't it stay at that place? Currently, it's right on top of the water line. It can't be there, period. Why did you put it on top of the water line? a vacant spot to stack it up, make repairs to some of the logs. That I think has been you done. may need to explain better the process of how, when you get a cabin, it didn't come over in one piece. You oh, know, no, 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 no. You take we it had apart. to tear all the additions right. down off of its historic structure, clean up the lot, right. dismantle the logs, label them, bring them home. The, you know, before you before you start putting the work into paying have your property surveyed and doing the soil science and all these things, you're like, well, do I really have the logs that I thought I had before I make this investment, you know? Um, which we do. We had to make some repairs, et cetera. I do want to get back to the soil scientists. It, if, if you look there, there's three fields. A lot of what's going on there with the garage, we have our existing septic field there, our existing septic tank. And if you look off the back of the property, it gets very narrow and very steep. It's not really shown on their map. We did provide a map. A well, Mr. Murphy says it was flat. This map that shows a fairly yeah, steep. Yeah, so if you look in the back V there, it gets very you steep. Have... There's also a pond back there. There's a road cut in where we build some fences. There's a lot of disqualifiers when it comes to septic soil. The reason we didn't map the entire property, 
<clears throat> is that when the soil scientist says it's not worth digging holes every 50 foot square right there because the soil's no good, you don't incur the spence and you don't dig holes all over your property to prove that the soil's no good. You go for the best soil as we did. Uh, it's labeled clearly we have Bodine soil in that portion of the land. Um, we also have to maintain, when he says limits of the soil, what, what the soil science is talking there is percent of grade. Once you get so steep, no matter how good the soil is, it's unusable. So we actually have a very narrow pocket there that qualifies at all, and we're fortunate enough that it does have good enough soil to use. Uh, if you look at the nature of the road in our community, I mean, the number one thing that dictates if there's a house in the first place and B, the location of the house, is the soil and the septic field. I mean, it's the number one deal. That's why we don't have development in our community. If we had sewers, there'd be houses everywhere. The soil is a great limiter. I mean, we're happy for it, but we're also happy that we have some good enough soil to build this cabin. I understand it's your preference not to have to take out, I think you referenced 15 to 25 mature trees. Correct. But if you don't get the variance, are you gonna take out the trees and put the cabin at the setback? Well, the, the septic field is there. I think that's the only option, yeah. Okay. So, so it, I don't want to do it, but yeah. And if you take out the trees and put it further back, but you're mm -hmm. going to have no trees covering it, it will, will it be visible from the road? Yes. Okay. As much or more so because of the blight of no right. mature trees. Right. That, again, will not grow back in any of our lifetimes. What, what, what type, is, is there any, on the proposed building site, what is there now? Is it, is it field? Is it... Uh, we've actually cleared the area so that we could do the septic installation, um, and then we've also dug out for the proper foundation for the cabin. If we have in our pack, John Michael, can you put the pictures up that we have? Mm -hmm. I don't know how to. There's a oh, there's an aerial view. Is that it? It's better on my screen. Okay, the next one, the one you had previously, I think. And so the road down here is Blue Hole Road. I'm asking the applicant. We actually own all the way to the end of the road there. Okay. We have a picture that's got, that actually I think shows the clearing. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's where the cabin is going. That's where Theoretically, we propose. it goes right there. Alternatively, everyone else seems to want it to go a little farther off the road. Okay, thank you. Okay, anything else to add? <clears throat> any other questions for the opposition? Happy to answer any questions, folks. Okay. I don't think we have any, I mean, app, app, applicant. Um, if you don't have anything else, so we're going to hear from the council person. Okay. okay. Thank you. Councilman Hall, please come forward and uh, help us determine what you think about this. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, in this instance, after talking to the applicant for some time and going through the packet that you guys have been provided, it actually answered questions that he and I had discussed before because my hesitation to it initially was where the health department weighed in. It was a concern about the septic, and he provided that information in the packet. So um, he's alleviated the concern that I had when it came to that septic field. If the health department says this is the location where it best fits or how septic should be done, I defer to health department's judgment on that. So, so or do you support having the cabin in the location that they're proposing? I, I do. I don't have a problem with it being in that proposed location. Um, the other mitigating factor in that for me was the trees, because trying to preserve those trees as much as possible is a huge factor. I don't see any new development in the future coming in into that area. Um, one of the issues that we have throughout that area in general is there's not a lot of infrastructure. And so by there not being any sewer, no plans to have any sewer or anything like that in the area for quite some time, if ever, I don't see the potential for the additional development unless someone else on the street wants to do something else with their particular property. Okay. 
Any other questions for the councilman? No, oh, thank, thank you. you for being here. Okay, um, let's close the public hearing discussion. Well, I mean, any anytime we have, uh, you know, uh, neighbors that a, a substantial amount of neighbors that have issue, I think that that does have <coughs> weight, and I appreciate the folks coming out. I do think, uh, and, and I and I understand uh, a lot of their arguments. I don't agree with all of them. I, the the value piece. I mean, and, you know, the the only old log home I know is the one across from, uh, you know, the Costco out off Charlotte and it's a historic uh, log house and it was preserved and I think it, it adds uh, to the to the area and I think something like this would add not detract um, especially given that it's an eight acre lot I do think they have established a hardship and have done as much work as any applicant that we've had to try to show that type of hardship uh, and I'm just trying to weigh impact on the neighbors, and I think the, you know the support of the council, the fact that the two people who uh, drive past it on a dead end road have come out and support it. Uh, I, I just have, I'm having a tough time with the opposition, uh, with, with giving that weight uh, to, enough to, to deny it because uh, I, I just haven't heard other than I don't want the cabin there. Um, Board members? I don't know. I mean, I, I, if you made a motion, I would second you. Okay. Do you have a motion? <laughs> um, well, I, I think, you know, again, uh, none, of, none of these, every property is unique. None, none <coughs> of, nothing is uh, precedent setting, but in this specific case, uh, based on uh, the topography uh, and the other drawings that, that uh, relate to uh, septic placement uh, clearings and the mature trees specifically, uh, I think that there is enough hardship to grant the variance uh, that's requested by the homeowner. Okay, motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes four to nothing. Okay, uh, John Michael, we need to take a break, and when we come back, let's take the case up because uh, Councilman Hastings is here. Take a 10 minute break and reconvene shortly thereafter. Mr. Chairman, let's reconvene here with the Board of Zoning Appeals meeting. Again, this, for the benefit of our record, this is the regularly scheduled meeting of October 18th, 2018. Mr. Chairman, you'd previously, the Board had previously expressed an interest in waiting on case 2018-504, the case that involved the property at 2030 Rosa Par Rosa L. Parks Boulevard, uh, until the district council member could be here to participate. Uh, council member DaCosta Hastings is present. The case, again, 2018-504, is a sidewalk variance request, as well as a request for a variance from landscape requirements. In this, the CS, or Commercial Services Zoning District, just as you enter into the metro center area, and this is oriented differently, I guess, uh, north to the bottom, south to the top there. Site plan submitted shows the proposed layout for the commercial endeavor that is scheduled to go in next. From my somewhat recent site visit, the property looking on the interior there in the lower right-hand corner and across the street in the upper left, the view up and down the current sidewalks along Roselle Parks Boulevard in this slide. The appellants are present. Councilmember Hastings is present, so we can hear from them. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 504? Seeing none, the appellants will have five minutes to make the desired presentation. No such time limitation on the district council member, of course, and we'll take up that case now. Okay. Uh, who wants to start? Councilman Hastings, or do you? We'll have the applicant start. 
Please identify yourself by name, address, and why you're here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for your service and hearing our case today. I'm the appellant, Philip Neal. I live at 1350 Rosa L. Parks Boulevard, in Nashville. And I'm the civil engineer that's assisting the Lewis family here with this project. So I'll let them introduce themselves. Thank you, everyone. My name is Michael Lewis. I live at 233 Burlington Place, Nashville, Tennessee. I'm here along with uh, Richard Lewis. Uh, we represent Metro D Partners, uh, longtime owners of the considered property at 2030 Rosa Parks Boulevard. Okay. So as, uh, as Michael <coughs> mentioned, Lewis family, they're longtime residents and owners uh, of this property for a long time, and they, they plan to hold on to it for a long time. And it's seen a few different uses over the years. Uh, it's been a Shoney's in the 90s, and it's been a uh, uh, auto facility or auto sales dealer for some recent years, and they're hoping to improve it to a more viable use for this uh, community. So I wanted to clarify first the request uh, mentioned the landscape variance. We've been able to work with Stephanie Givett directly, and we have no request for any kind of landscape variance that we're asking today. Okay, good. The, the variance we are asking for is uh, from the sidewalk uh, requirements. So um, the standard right-of-way section that the MCSP dictates here is a six-foot bikeway, six-foot grass strip, and an eight-foot sidewalk. Um, and so as you see in those photos there, there's an existing sidewalk there of about nine feet in width that's along the entire frontage. And there's an eight-foot bikeway that's uh, currently existing on the roadway as well. So it's in good shape. It doesn't need any repair or replacement. And there's a few hardships also that we'd like to point out. The first would be topographic. Um, as you can see in that photo on the top left, there as we head south towards the city, the slope actually gets quite a bit steeper as it comes up to the back of the sidewalk. And so if we were to widen that sidewalk, there would be quite a bit of improvements that would have to be made, as, as including retaining walls, et cetera, that would be right up uh, against the right of way or even within. And really to maintain that usable property, it would be about 250 square feet of retaining wall that we've, that we've calculated. Um, and it would likely, this is TDOT right away, as you probably know, so um, we would have to, we'd be very careful of any kind of encroachment onto the DOT right of way um, that they were, that they would be very resistant to. Um, there's also a lot of infrastructure here. Um, you'll notice that there's some large Cobra head TDOT street lighting that, that have been there that would need to be relocated um, and find a suitable place for those. There's a 60 foot existing pylon sign there that is, um, it's about 14 feet wide and it's within four feet of the uh, right of way limits right now. So with widening that sidewalk, we would be very aware and, and careful not to encroach on the right of way again. Um, there's also some large stormwater and electric service lines that run parallel and uh, perpendicular to Rosa Parks that we would uh, likely have to relocate to add the sidewalk. Um, so we've, we've been able to work closely with Public Works on the design um, through uh, up to this point. And as you'll hear in a few minutes, we have Councilman Hastings here to support as well. So considering these hardships, um, we'd like to uh, ask that you waive any sidewalk requirements here, including the in lieu of fee, um, so we can reuse the existing sidewalk that's here in place and, and providing that safe means of alternate transportation um, as is. Okay. Any questions for the applicant? Yes. Why can't you pay into the fund? So we're, we're asking that we be waived of that payment, and um, it's our opinion that the sidewalk you know, the, the real point of that um, provision is to provide sidewalk um, where we don't have it existing. Um, so the fact that we have sidewalk along our entire frontage and we're in an area that uh, is, has plenty of sidewalk, we're asking that that be waived. Um, but I'll say that we're, we're also open to a discussion of different yeah. options. But that's an ask, not a, a reason really. But the planning department recommends either constructing the sidewalks or paying into the in lieu fund. So that's why I was asking the question. Okay. Um, are we ready to hear from the council person? Yes, Councilman Hastings, please come forward and um, thank you for being here and you have our condolences and sympathy for the loss of your dear mother recently. I know um, that's one of the reasons why this case was deferred previously. So, but thank you for being here today. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. And thank all of you. <clears throat> I'm having a little drainage thing going on, so excuse me with my, my clutter. Uh, this, is, this is something that uh, we as the council and actually uh, 
just just we have been over this the sidewalk issue has been something that has been all over our backs uh, we did it I, I voted for it uh, I, I apologize to all of you uh, Not to me. <laughs> for all of the time that you have you know taken of our madness but overall we are looking to correct some of these things. But as you know, our city needs walkability and oh, yeah. bikeability. And oh. so talk to us about this because yeah. it seems like there's some existing sidewalks and bike lanes. So yes, sir. what are you here the, to tell us? The we existing, have your letter. Yeah, the existing in this area, there's already. Now, I live right around the corner from here. So uh, there is already existing sidewalks and also bike lanes that people use. And we are having issues now with with um, a lot of cars because there's more and more residents that are that are moving to the area, <clears throat> not necessarily looking to to put in more you know sidewalks. We want to put in more sidewalks, so walkability, so people can walk in their community and go to to the public parks. We have beautiful parks in our community <coughs> and other other things. But as of right now, there is no need on this side to be able to take up this existing sidewalk when that will be the only piece that will be done on this side of the street. There's banks, there's there's um, uh, convenience stores, there's other things that are there, especially with the things that are, that are um, going to be designed with this current establishment. It is something that the current hotels that have been moving in, we need more eateries. We need other things to be able to be there. But as of right now, it is set. The atmosphere is set. The sidewalks are there. We don't need to go and tear up something that is there to do it all over again. That is one of the issues that we're having as the council with looking at this because of right now, all it's going to do is, is actually just put a new existing sidewalk there that doesn't match anything around that. And it's going to take off the, the bike lanes and things that are already put into place. We don't want that. Okay, so Councilman Hastings, what about the in lieu fund? What is your recommendation and, and does? The, the in lieu fund right now, uh, honestly, I, I, I don't wanna I don't wanna get into that because that's legislative stuff. No, but as far as yeah. your recommendation yeah. with this case, yeah. are, are and, you saying that with they this should with this case, I, I don't think that they should pay in the in lieu of at, at this point uh, for the establishment because of that with the development that is coming there, my environment, my my district, my area that I represent needs what they're they're looking to bring. Okay, and you're saying that the existing nine foot sidewalk is sufficient for this? Yes, sir. Okay. It is, Dave. And the drop off too, because yes, I've, I've been to that Arby's. It does kind of start going down. Yeah, yeah. Right. That's that's when you get in the parking lot. It it goes all the way down. Okay. But, Any other questions for the councilman? We appreciate you being here. Thank you. All right. Thank all of you. Thanks for apologizing to us with a smile. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Have a good do, one. Do we have any other questions of the applicant, board members? I don't. Okay. Let's close the public hearing discussion. Well, I'm probably going to be the one that kills the, the good vibe in here, but until the council changes the legislation not to require that in lieu fund. I just have trouble not applying it to everyone throughout Davidson County. And that's okay. and I'm just not going to change my position on that. Although I appreciate what and, the council people say, but and the I legislation has not changed. And I have a bright line test that I don't think has been abused by any member of this Metro Council. If someone who and they all voted for it, as Councilman Hastings said, they come here and say, and they have a reason why someone should not have to build a sidewalk and pay into the fund, you know, I'm going to go along with their logic as a representative district and also someone that has made an argument why. And so for that reason, I would like to make a motion that we approve the variance and for the sidewalks um, that they don't have to build a new sidewalk or pay into the fund because of the topography issues of the drop-off, the stormwater and electric service lines, and the light poles in the um, right-of-way. And the existing sidewalk. And the, exi the existing sidewalk is nine feet in good shape. I think that one of the, an additional factor to be noted is that it is a, a, a T-dot, it is a highway, um, and, and that thing that does, in some cases, distinguish it from other 
Yeah, and, and also that there's a, a bike lane right next to it, and the kind of curb and gutter is to protect more people, and the bike lane offers a, an additional buffer. So that's my motion. Is oh. there a second? second. Motion has been made and properly seconded. Any more discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Opposed. Okay, it's three to one. What well, it'll stay on our agenda. Um, we have t um, two other board members, and hopefully one of them will review the case and we can have a resolution. Okay, yeah. John, John will tell us in two seconds just how that, how that process. John, we have three to one vote, and so tell us what that means and how we proceed. We'll hold that case up until the next board meeting. That's scheduled for November the 1st, 2018, at the same location due to early voting. So that will stay open for other board members to consider if they are in attendance at the November 1st meeting and have had the opportunity to review both the case file and the recording of today's presentations, then those board members have a chance to vote at that time. Okay, very good, thank you. Uh, next case, John Michael. Mr. Chairman, the next case to be presented to the board is 2018-555. Yes. Oh, that's right. We're Mr. Chairman, earlier today you had a case that had been recommended for consent agenda that was pulled off of consent agenda because one uh, attendee for today's meeting had concerns about the case. That was case 2018-565. The case involved the property at 829 Lishia Avenue. It was involved for a special exception seeking heights, uh, height variance and also setback variance. It's a case where the uh, individual who is concerned about the case has actually had the opportunity to speak with the appellant and representatives for the appellant. The district council member, Scott Davis, from Sc uh, council district number five, is also present. And apparently the concerns have been resolved. That case will be eligible to go back on consent agenda, uh, conditioned upon certain stipulations that have been agreed to be between the parties. If you'd like, we can invite the representative forward to address those concerns so that the any motion with regard to this matter could be done in the correct okay. way. Let's hear, at this time. let's hear from the representative. Mr. Hargis, tell us what's going on here. Hi, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Joey Hargis, Baker Dawson. Uh, we met with Pastor Lloyd, who's the uh, pastor of the church immediately to the south, and, and addressed his concerns with the applicant out in the hallway. Uh, we we will agree to a, a couple conditions, which I'll email John Michael to that way they'll be included in the order. Okay, but what are they? Uh, they are uh, concerns that the uh, rooftop decks or patios not be visible uh, to the southern property line. That's that's the church property to the south, mm -hmm. and that we'll agree to work with the church on the installation of a uh, privacy type fence. Okay. And work with them on design and style and such. What such? Okay, so those will be part of our um, motion. So I'll move that back to the consent agenda you, with those two um, added uh, requirements. Yes. Okay, okay. Yes, motion's sure. been made. Yes. Uh, Councilman's here as well. If you'd like to. Hear oh it. yes, Councilman Davis. <coughs> this is six five sixty five. Hey. Hey, thank you, commissioners, for your volunteering. Thank you, code staff, for all the hard work you do. Um, the applicant, you know, lives in my district also. And the applicant, this is not even a zoning matter, went to two neighborhood meetings, um, McFerrin and Cleveland Park. And I got a couple of calls. And those neighborhood associations, they ask tough questions. Yes, they do. And... Like I always say, what I go, what I do for the big developer, I do for my neighbor. And the gentleman, Mr. Brasher, is my neighbor. And so I fully support him. But I'm also happy that, because I got a couple of calls from some of the church members, I'm also happy as a good neighbor, which he is, he got with the pastor and they worked out their, their, their minor, minor issues. And I'm glad everybody's happy because I would not want a church upset at me. Absolutely, we don't. We don't. No Very good. So I just want to thank everybody and thank him for being so diligent and such a good neighbor. Okay. Amen. So any questions for the councilman? No. Okay. So um, I'll move that back on the consent agenda with two uh, conditions. Um, and it's been made okay. properly seconded. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes. John Michael. 
Mr. Chairman, case 2018-555 involves the property at 617 Cottonwood Drive. This is in Council District Number 14 on the eastern edge of the county. The request in this case is for variances to the size and rear setback restrictions in this residentially zoned district for the construction of an accessory building behind the primary structure. To be clear, I think your uh, docket <coughs> may have described this as a detached accessory dwelling unit or day do. That is not the case. It's just a regular accessory building from our review of the file. The max footprint here is 700 square feet. The request is for 810. There's also a rear setback reduction requested as uh, outlined here on the uh, rendering of the proposed construction. From our staff's recent site visit, you see the face of the property in the lower right-hand corner, the view up and down the street on these two photographs. Um, Jonathan Steele is the appellant and owner of the property. If Mr. Steele is present, please come forward and I'll ask, is there anyone here in opposition to case number 555? Seeing none, the appellant will have five minutes to make the desired presentation. Please just introduce yourself by name and address. Yes. Opposition? Opposition. Great. The appellant will have 10 minutes to make the desired presentation, as will the opposition. Save any time you want for rebuttal out of your original 10. Jonathan Steele at 617 Cottonwood Drive. Okay. Why are we here? Uh, I moved uh, to this location about four years ago, and in the very back of the property, there is a concrete structure, pre-existing foundation, and uh, now I'm at the uh, the point in my after four years where I could afford to put a roof on it and make it a garage. So does it have walls now? It has three walls in the front. The first one on the front has the lower level as if they were making a three-car garage. No poured floor or roof, just the existing walls. But so, I'm sorry, you said no what floor? There's no concrete flooring. It's just dirt. Okay, but it has a poured foundation. The concrete sitting on a foundation, not dirt and it just doesn't have a roof, you're not adding a second story to it? Okay. And it was there when you bought the property. Okay. What, what do you plan to use this for? Uh, with the houses in that area, they're kind of small, and I like to do a lot of woodworking and stuff, so I hope to make it into a workshop kind of area, storage <laughs> workshop area. And it'll be totally enclosed? Yes. Okay. And not used for any dwelling? Okay. Any other questions for the applicant? Let's hear from the opposition, and uh, you'll have eight minutes and 40 seconds to respond. Opposition, please come forward, state your name, address, and why you're opposed to this request. Lori Reed, 2836 Surrey Road, and he's in the back of my property. We just act, I'm Susan Keeling, I live at 2836 Surrey Road. I'm not understanding how this affects my property and why we got this. Okay. You got this because it was 600 feet away from this request. And John Michael, do you want to fill them in on the rest? All property owners who own property within 600 feet of the property that's making a request, you're required to do nothing. If you support it, that's great. If you oppose it, that's great. If you don't have an opinion on it, that's okay too. But we send out the notice requirements to everybody, and that's why. If you own property, so if you're feet, if you're familiar with the property, as he said, that this kind of these walls have been put up, and he just wants to finish it off and make it a okay. completed garage. It doesn't affect my property in, in any way whatsoever. Unless you say it does. Nope. Yeah, and, that, and that's why we send the notice. We we can't determine if it if it impacts your property. That's why we send a notice, and that way that way you can think about it and say, do I care? Does it hurt me? Does it hurt my property? If he, you know, he bought Does this. Does it encroach he, on my view? Yeah, he, he bought a house that had three walls on it. He wants to put a roof on it and, and close it for a wood shop. And if that impacts you negatively, then that, this is your chance to say, no, I don't want it. It impacts me. But if you don't have an issue with it, then that's okay, too. But that, that's why you got a notice. Yes. Just to let you know. That's, and we really appreciate you being here. Okay. And you can stay. Yes, yeah. exactly. And the applicant come <laughs> back forward. Okay. So, and that's why we also encourage, although, you know, we're sending out the letters that, you know, some people actually kind of talk to their immediate neighbors and tell them what they're going to do. So, uh, do you have anything else to add? Okay, very good. We'll close the public hearing discussion. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't I'm have, a, yeah, I don't have any issue with it. Do we have a motion? I'll make yeah. a motion that we, that we uh, grant the variance to allow him to build on the existing foundation. Okay. Motion's been made. Is there a second? second? Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any more discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? 
passes unanimously. Good luck. Thank you for being here. Thank you all. Okay, John Mr. Michael. Mr. Chairman, the next case to be heard is case number 2018-556. Out in Council District Number 9, Jason Cleave is the appellant and co-property owner at 384 Rio Vista Drive. As you'll note on your docket, there are actually 11 parcels included in this request. Stringing south and slightly eastward along Rio Vista Drive is shown from this original zoning map. The property is owned RS 7.5, and with these single-family developments, the proposal would include a reduction in the required front setback from 20 feet to 10 on each of the 11 parcels. The aerial here gives you an idea of the lush green area along the river that will be developed. The site plan submitted, although small in this slide, is included in your uh, packet where you can review with a little more detail. There. Uh, the appellant is present. As you'll recall, Councilman uh, Bill Pridemore is also present to address this topic. I need to ask, is there anyone here in opposition to case number 556? Seeing none. The appellant will have uh, five minutes to make the desired presentation to the board, and the board can hear from the councilman whenever he wishes to address the board. Okay, will the applicant please swim forward, state your name, address, and why you're here. How you doing? My name is Michael Slowey. I represent Jason Cleave, uh, the appellant, and I live at 141 Saxon Miss Drive in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, we have submitted a, a <clears throat> request for a uh, variance to change our front setback from 20 to 10 feet due to our uh, floodplain that runs on the back side of the property, which is due to the uh, okay, Cumberland so River. Okay, so explain to us the difference between the floodplain and the floodway. Uh, well, it's <clears throat> the floodplain is uh, an air, it's a hundred. Well, <laughs> the 100 year floodplain is running through the middle of our property, as you can see on the survey. So um, that means you have to build differently. But now, where, where's I mean, uh, make sure I understand this right because I see a hundred year, I see something that says approximate 100, 100 year, and it's it's like a third of the way toward exactly. the right, so it's not. And then there's another line that says top of top of bank. That's it's a, it's on the bluff uh, along the river, and the the floodplain is actually at the very bottom half on the right side of the property. And it's so I guess I, I'm not sure I understand how the floodplain's a hardship if you got a bluff between you and the floodplain. We have uh, a 75 foot buffer off of the 100 year floodplain that we have to avoid, and as you can see on the the rear of each. Uh, building envelope on the drawing here, that 75 is represented between the 100-year uh, floodplain, and then also there's a bluff that runs in between. So we're kind of stuck on the back of that, but uh, but uh, excuse me, the back of the bluff <laughs> as well. And we're trying to move it forward so we have um, a better building floodplain. Or excuse me, a, who do you want to represent? Talk for me. I'm kind of jumbling here. Just a here. better <laughs> Jason Cleave. Um, a better building envelope for us. <coughs> so if you look at the dark line, the dark colored line, not actually the spaced out line, that's the bluff sight line right there. Right. So realistically, it drops off right there. So the floodplain doesn't actually come onto the property at all. The elevation is high enough to where it's mm -hmm. out of floodplain. So, I mean, are you wanting the variance to avoid the bluff or are you... Yes, to come closer on the street, and we would have front entry garages on them. Yeah, I mean, and you know, and my, I mean, ten feet is, you know, is really really short, and that, and the only reason, you know, and I know that it was this was something that was eligible, I think, for the consent agenda, and I had some concerns about it, and I just wanted to hear it, but, you know, I mean, you're not putting in sidewalks, I understand, right? That's correct. So, I mean, that that would be, you know, I mean, I I, I think of a ten foot front-loaded garage house, I mean, it's it's like me walking down my alley where all the garages are set 10 feet off, and that's where all the houses are. I mean, there's, you know, there's just something about it that that has some safety issues to me. Although, so I, I guess I'm, I'm concerned about the sidewalk and the walkability between the houses. Um, we're, we're also a, about 10 feet off of the street to our property line in the right of way, so well that we makes a difference. <laughs> that's, that's, all right, <laughs> that, that that wasn't clear, so that that's a good point. Any other questions? Thank to you. The that, that's a really good. That that helps with right. my concern. 
I know you're only here on these 11 parcels. Are these the only 11 you own? Because it looks like we've got. So John, Michael, tell us about what happened and we actually heard the cases on the other ones, right? Yes, Mr. Chairman, to the south, actually you're fine. To the south, you heard a batch of cases in, I believe it was August of this year. Okay. Um, they had a slightly different setback requirement. They had a slightly different request in terms of their front setback variance. I believe that was a, I have in mind a 35 foot requirement that was reduced to 20 and I don't have the documents in front of me right now, but they were on this same line. But they were approved. The southeast, they were approved. Okay. Again, as we we've always follow we've up ourselves We've addressed to say. sort of this area. Well, and it, it also looks like, I mean, I, part of it, when I was looking at the aerial view, which caused a little bit of the concerns that I have, where those houses were sitting uh, obviously further back from the street uh, to me, based on uh, on the aerial Google Maps, um, the bluff is different too. I mean, it looks like on your drawing that the bluff changes and it, it becomes closer to the river. Um, and that wasn't, that wasn't it is clear. I mean, the, the this drawing, even when I blow it up on the computer, is still fairly blurry, and I couldn't see bluff. <laughs> so, that, you know, so I wanted you to ex help explain it to me. So, any other questions of the applicant? No. Okay. Thank you for being here. Closed public hearing. Council. Oh, Councilman, yes, the duly elected representative of the ninth district. Thank you for being here, Councilman Pridemore, and uh, tell us about this particular parcel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Thank you, Commissioners, for. Uh, allow me to speak, Bill Pridemore, District 9, uh, in the Madison area. This, uh, I, I'm in support of this, of the appellant. Uh, as you see with the river there <clears throat> and the and <clears throat> Rio Vista Drive, there's a very limited space as to what can be uh, uh, constructed on the property. And this, their plans, plan, site plan fits perfect <coughs> for an area that has been vacant uh, for so as long as I can remember. So this is something that would, uh, I would say, certainly um, uh, it fits perfect to the to the uh, the lay of the land and the fact that it would add house tops to our community and it would improve that particular community. So okay. I'm, I ask for your support. Thank you. Any questions for Councilman <coughs> Pridemore? Thank you. Nope. For Thank you for being here. Thank you. Let's close the public hearing discussion. Well, my, my biggest concern was the distance from the road, and, and I should have asked a question earlier, and I didn't, but it, it's okay. given the 10 feet from uh, the road uh, to the property line, the additional 10, I don't have a Well, issue. therefore, do you have a motion then? Um, I'll, move, I'll move that uh, because of the, the topographical hardship um, of the floodplain and the bluff that this uh, variance uh, be approved. Okay, motion's been made. Is there a second? I'll second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes. John Michael. Mr. Chairman, the next case for the board's consideration is 2018-557. That involves the property at 2407 Dickerson Pike, shown here on the zoning map, a CS, or Commercial Services Zone property, shown here on the aerial photograph. Uh, the request is for a special exception to establish use and occupancy as a kennel. To be clear, this is a business that's up and running. It's recently discovered that they didn't have exactly what they needed by way of the use and occupancy permitting and therefore needed to come to the Board of Zoning Appeals to obtain the special exception in order to secure their final UNO for kennel use. The view up and down Dixon Pike at this location, proper signage located there at the intersection. Uh, this is located in Council District Number 5, and we're joined today by Councilman Scott Davis from Council uh, District Number 5. Devin Comline is the appellant for the business at this location. Uh, you may wish to hear from the district council member and then from the appellant. Is there anyone here today in opposition to case number 557? Seeing none, it'll be five minutes to make the desired presentation. We'll invite the appellant forward and we'll invite the council member forward. Okay, very good. Will the applicant please come forward? Please state your name and address for the record and why we're here. Hi, my name is Devin Comline. I live at 1447 Snell Boulevard. Okay. Um, as John Michael uh, mentioned, I have been up and running for about a year and a half. Uh, we actually had a final use and occupancy from codes um, come through. I have, um, I've got the letter here. Um, we, about six months ago, we had a, um, a it was Darrell Hardrick uh, came as a, um, came and told us that we were uh, not uh, that we weren't uh, legally uh, 
running our business, and I showed him this uh, this final use and occupancy, which wasn't clearly um, displayed in the um, in, in codes. They didn't um, they didn't put it through the right way. Um, I showed him. They said, "Yep, you're good to go." And two months ago, he came back and um, said that somebody had brought up the same issue. Um, and apparently, it was that we uh, didn't go through the proper channels through the, uh, the through the BZA here. Uh, the the CS zoning allows for a kennel uh, as long as they meet as long as it meets the special and general or the specific and general conditions. Uh, we do meet both of those. Um, we we are more than 200 feet away from a property. Um, we're harming we're harming nobody. I had a I had a meeting uh, held um, on the sixth. Uh, of October, we had one person show up, and they voiced their um, their support. I have a couple additional uh, letters that I didn't that I forgot to bring because I had to walk a bunch of dogs this morning. Um, but uh, everyone, as far as I've heard, everyone is in support of us. We've been operating a pretty fun business for a year and a half here, and um, it was a sex shop before it was this. So um, we've cleaned up the neighborhood a little bit. Um, that's all I got. Okay. Any questions of the applicant? Huh? It okay. looks like we have a letter of opposition. Yes, yeah, from the Antioch area. It's a that very lengthy confused. letter, two yeah. and a half pages long, and just generally not liking kennels. Cane Ridge Road? Are you anywhere near Cane Ridge Road? In District 31? I mean, he's in no. District 5. Yes. You're in District 5, and this, okay. yeah, this sounds like someone who doesn't like kennels. Kennels and, in general. Just, okay. But it doesn't seem like they're personally impacted. Okay. okay. Any other questions? Okay, we're going to close the public hearing discussion. So this is much. Oh yes, How could, Councilman Davis. He'll he'll know the question. How close is this to District Thirty One? It's quite a distance away. Since we don't have Miss Sanford here, she would know the answer. But um, it's quite a distance. Yes. Okay. I don't, it doesn't even touch that district. T tell us about um, your. Uh, I'm assuming support of this uh, business. I am support. Please have mercy on this young man. He opened up the business and thought he had the right tools. You know, obviously it's a good looking building. It used to be a, a crazy sex shop back in the day. And you know, this, you know the area is moving along quite nicely. Um, however though, I do want to address one concern and it's not with the young man or his business here. Okay, if we could put in there, just so, I own a dog myself, and it's East Nashville. I love my East Nashville neighbors tremendously. But sometimes, you know, a lot of us, you know, try to be very, you know, a lot of people in my district have four-legged children, okay? And just so, and like you saw the email or the or letter from a, the, the, the nice citizen in Antioch or in South Nashville, I had a couple of people um, call me. I didn't even know there was an issue with this, you know, um, concern. And just so that I can say to, to the few people and some people who don't live in my district that I'm not, I am not endangering any animals, that, you know, that he be granted his permit pending he has a letter cleared by animal control, which he has no issues in front of them now. Is that is that is that allowed? I'm sorry. I, it, he just has to meet with other requirements. Animal yeah. control. Yeah. Yeah. There are other requirements to run a kennel that doesn't have anything to do with us. But yes, he has to yeah, meet yeah, with yeah, us. Yeah. Yeah. This would no. I yeah. guess the good news is for yeah. we don't have the authority to give that your variance. I don't think District so. Five okay. count, uh, business. Right. We've had what about three or four kennel cases in the last few months, and there's always kind of heated opposition and. Don't see anyone here today in opposition present, so. I'm not in opposition to a, to a kennel. Oh, yep. I'm not sorry, to a doggy daycare. Okay, very good. Any questions for Councilman Davis? Thank you. Your request was that a condition be placed that he meets the requirements of Metro Animal Control? Uh, yeah, or whatever the, you know, that. The health department? I, the health department. Is I it guess more of a statement? Health department. Because, I mean, he. I can, I can. Come, come, yeah. come forward. I think the applicant sounds like he knows. Yeah, the, um, yeah. th that's actually a major a major problem with um, daycares and kennels right now is that there are no regulations. So um, that's yeah, it's something that I'm working on. Um, <coughs> I, I'm meeting with a number of um, 
a number of other pet care there, professionals. Are there it. accredited kennels? I'm sure there are. No nationwide. No. Oh, well, so so Colorado has state laws that um, that regulate daycares and and boarding facilities. Um, it, it, so if you wanted to voluntarily do something, follow some other state that th has. And th that's uh, that's what we're that's what, what we are working towards doing is um, we follow a number of training. As long as the health department is cool, okay. and you know, because he can attest too, because we love our dogs in East Nashville. You know, mm -hmm. it'll it will keep the. Um, <laughs> it, it, Keep the, some of the overbearing um, four-legged um, person, the four-legged family member lovers, from beating me up. <laughs> yeah, it's it's an issue that is that allows me to say, hey, there's no there's no issue among that. There's no okay. yeah. be a, be, a, have an issue. be a good neighbor, communicate like your council person does, and awesome. you should be okay. Thank right. you. Um, I have a question for our zoning administrator. Is there yep. uh, is there language that? would allow us to do that without causing the applicant more trouble because <coughs> help 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 us know how we should recommend that because I, I can say the health department but if the health department doesn't inspect kennels and that is you know a, it would not be inappropriate to include a condition in a board motion that the applicant follow any state or local laws associated with this type of business perfect thank okay. you do you want to make a motion um, I'll move that we approve the special exception for the kennel um, and with the expectation that the applicant does follow all uh, applicable uh, state and local laws regarding kennel operation. Okay, motion's been made and properly seconded. Any more discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes. John Michael. Good luck. Mr. Chairman, the next case for the board's consideration is 2018-559. Case involves a property at 1411 Gallatin Avenue in Council District Number 7. Dewey Engineering is the appellant on behalf of their client, Young's Fashion Incorporated, the owner of that property. The request is for a variance from the sidewalk requirements in this, the CS, Commercial Services Zoning District, in conjunction with the proposed construction of new real retail space and prefer to build without updating the existing sidewalks. The aerial here shows you the uh, well-developed commercial corridor in this portion of Gallatin. The site plan submitted shows a proposed con uh, layout for the new development. This, of course, is also in your packets, board members. From staff's recent site visit, face of the property shown here in the lower right-hand corner, the view across the street in the upper left, then the views up and down Gallatin for the sidewalk that already exists at this location. Michael Dewey is here as the appellant from Dewey Engineering on behalf of the property owner. I'll ask first, is there anyone here in opposition to case number 559? Very well, we'll invite Mr. Dewey forward at this time. Uh, he'll have five minutes to make the desired presentation. Hi, my name is uh, Michael Dewey with Dewey Engineering. Um, I've got a couple handouts for uh, for you guys. I don't know. And this is a project that's currently under construction. And when we went out there and met with the contractor and uh, owner in August. They question, you know, they started laying out the sidewalks and they started questioning why we were um, redoing the sidewalks. So this is very similar to your case, I guess, three or four cases ago where there's existing sidewalks. Uh, we met with John Michael, we met with public, we coordinated with Public Works, and, um, and we reached out to the council person, council person for this district, Anthony Davis, the um, first uh, sheet in your one of your packages is an email f uh, correspondence between us and Councilman Davis. Uh, he supports our request. Uh, we asked him about the uh, and Luffy. Um, he and he seems to be supportive of knowing Luffy since the sidewalks are were recently installed by Metro uh, less than three years ago. So. The other thing that I wanted to, um, so these sidewalks were installed. Well, let me ask you for clarification because we have this letter, no, email. Does he in the email talk about the Inlufi? Uh, 
he, so we, we down below say, since the sidewalks are relatively new, we were thinking it would be best to keep the si existing sidewalks along the property frontage and not pay the in lieu fee. And so that was one uh, email, and then we responded, or he responded with, I'm good with it. Okay. And, uh, and then I've further sent another email to him and said, hey, uh, just to make sure, are you, are you, did you see my part about the in lieu fee? And he said, yes, I see that. Yeah, gotcha. take, it to pay, take it to BZA. So. They also said not sending dramatic support things right in the middle. I would just let the BZA decide. That's yes, that's correct. That's, that's the email. Uh, so these sidewalks were installed, you know, less than three years ago by, by Metro. Uh, I think one of the things that's different about this is that uh, the transit plan has since, before, when this sidewalk, when this building permit was uh, issued, the sidewalk plan was for four foot sidewalks and eight foot, for four foot grass strip, eight foot sidewalks. That plan has since changed now to a four foot sidewalk, four foot grass strip, 10 foot sidewalk. So I guess the whole question that planning is raising about, we want uniformity in uh, for future uh, uh, connect connectivity, you know, it's, it's changed within the past year. And so with that, you know, if there's no, we would like to keep it consistent to, to keep the uniformity as it is today. Um, again, we don't have any opposition and we don't have, uh, and we um, have, we feel like we've got our, the council persons, the leadership support in this community. And, um, um, and, and, and the other thing is these sidewalks, there was probably miles of sidewalks that were installed with this Metro project. This would create a jog in the sidewalks that would create like a 90 linear foot grass strip for up, upon miles of, of, uh, of continuous sidewalk. Uh, there is a, um, so the narrowness of the lot plays a part of it. There's a, there's a stormwater feature in the front of this property that, uh, that so if, if, we, if we build the sidewalks per metro, the sidewalks will be closer to the, the wall that the bioretention area, um, uh, for, for the bioretention area. Um, and again, I just ask that you support this. We've got, uh, um, we don't, uh, that the in lieu fee, is double the price that it would cost to just install these, but the owner is is just adamant about uh, it. Just would look awkward. Is is um, so the because of the narrowness of the lot. I'm going to ask the same question of you as I asked the other applicant before. Why can't you pay the in lieu fee? It's 90 lineal feet, I think you said, and I believe the in lieu fee is 152 lineal foot, so that's uh, $13,000. Why, why? And I'm not saying you, you're a you're, uh, client. Sure. Yes, yes, ma'am. Uh, so the entire property frontage, so there's 90 linear feet of, of grass strip. The entire frontage is 124 linear feet. Um, and I, uh, as far as not paying the in lieu fee, he would be, in this case, better off to just install the, the sidewalks because it's about half the price than the, than the in lieu fee. Um, he just thinks it's, it will look awkward is, uh, to be honest, is the, is the bottom line. So the, um, and I'll say the same thing as I said for the last one, the planning department recommends disapproval that of the variance request to, and they're requesting to construct the sidewalks. So just, yes, just the yes. now. Yeah, we worked with them since, or we, we've been coordinating with them since uh, I think August uh, about this, and um, and we tried to try to work out a solution. Uh, we worked with Public Works uh, to keep the to keep the curbing continuous along or consistent. So at least the, we're not going to be doing a curb and gutter where there's just post curb right now. Uh, so Public Works has has coordinated is is agreed with what what we would like to, to do. Um, but, but you know, I understand that planning wants uh, connectivity and uniform sidewalks for, as we 
move on in the future, but I think, as you heard other council, the Councilman Hastings speak earlier, I think there's may have been a change in in sentiment of, among the council. At least that's what we're hearing from Councilman Hastings and the councilmen for this district. Okay. We're anxiously awaiting that legislation to be changed. <laughs> Any other questions of the applicant? Okay, we're going to close public hearing discussion. So we have the letter from Councilman Davis, which, as you pointed out, doesn't really. I don't think as to the in lieu fee. I mean, I, I could read his email a couple of ways as to the in lieu fee. He's saying to just let the BZA decide. Uh, I mean, I think that's a little lukewarm on waiving the in lieu right. fee. And, you know, my bright line with waiving the in lieu fee is the council person shows up in person too and ask. Well, then we could ask the questions, how enthusiastic are you? Or is this, oh, you decide, but yeah, maybe, I don't know. What's your? Well, well I think that what we end up seeing is the reality of the legislation. And <coughs> sometimes we try to, uh, tweak it in a way that makes sense to what the legislation probably should be and what most, hopefully most council people would agree to because they're the ones that are always saying in this case it should be something different. I mean, they are weighing in that way. Um, because what you have in this case is a very real situation where uh, if someone was budget conscious, which most business people are, um, they will go the least expensive route, and if that means building it to the current standard, then they probably will do that rather than pay uh, the frontage, which I get. And I also agree with the applicant that in this case, I mean, in cases like this where you have miles of, of city-built three-year-old sidewalks, uh, it may be a generation before, and another public works project uh, before it's all uniform, and I've seen enough of these jogs to wonder how many people talking on their cell phone, walking down the sidewalk, fall into a grass strip, you know, or fall into somebody's yard. Kind of so, like Mr. Magoo. Yeah, I mean, so, you know, it, 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 it's not against sidewalks. It sounds good in concept, but it also, you know, the budgetary re realities of it say, well, no, I, I'll just build it like the city wants me to, and we'll have a really strange sidewalk on Gallatin Road. Um, this, you know, there is no bike lane, so I think that the sidewalk to the road is uh, less safe than the last one. But um, I think this is that one of those cases where we're expected to solve problems that the city council probably should have should have solved and is, I think, actively solving. Not uh, they, they keep saying that they're working on it. Well, so it I, a, it's I'm a hard sure it one. Takes a lot of effort and thought to change legislation. You know, I mean, I don't I don't want us to become the legislative body because we're not. But I, I do think that the applicant makes uh, makes some very good points. Does anyone have a motion? Well, I'd like to also say that the planning <coughs> department works hard on these evaluations as well. And for me, I know the rest of you maybe favor the council person's recommendation more than I do. Um, not that I don't value their recommendations, but when I see these planning recommendations that say disapproval, that weighs on me, just as yeah. in the same way that council people, mm -hmm. um, their recommendations weigh on all of you. And, and I think that's fair, especially that now that we're seeing the planning department, uh, I think there was a, a, a initially, and I can't speak for the planning department, I can just respond to how I viewed a lot of the recommendations. There was an awful lot more, uh, there were very, very few cases where there was ever an approval. And, and I don't think I remember any outright approvals. And we're starting to see more of those. So they, they have evolved in the way mm -hmm. that they're viewing this too. So I, I, I do appreciate that. I think there was a time when everything was, you know, just follow That's the letter until yep. they, they could come up with how they really, how it made sense. Um, no, they work hard on this And, and they do work really hard on it. And, and you get a two or three page uh, opinion that's very thoughtful always. So I, I get that. So with that being said, who has a motion? Well, I will move to disapprove the variance request. Okay, motion has been made. Is there a second? No second. <laughs> motion fails. Any, Anybody have another motion? 
Well, I tend to, in this case, I would make the motion to grant the variance, but a condition on them paying the in lieu fee. Okay. And that's, I understand where sure. that mm -hmm. leads us. Yep. But that's your, that's, that's your motion. your motion. Okay. Yeah, that's what I was trying. That That's, that's a better motion than what I said. Oh, okay. I will go. I could go with that. Okay. So do we second that motion? Second. Okay. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Four nothing. John Michael. With apologies, Mr. Chairman, I have no idea what you just voted. What was that motion again? Four to nothing. Um, they have to pay into the fund. Do we noted. Variance granted, but pay in the fund. We'll bring us to our next case, Mr. Chairman. Case 2018-561. And by the way, we are enjoying our new paperless BZA agenda. Thank you, Sean, who's sitting in the back, and Jessica, too. Um, this has been very easy to follow, and, um, you know, Mr. Taylor has his own fancy uh, uh, iPad there, but that's also... Mr. Taylor can't read anything anymore without glasses. Very, very <laughs> compatible, so, Sean, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chairman, our next case is 2018-561. That case involves the property at 7194 Whites Creek Pike in Council District No. 1. Bobby Dietz is the appellant on behalf of O'Reilly Automotive Stores Incorporated, the owner of this property, shown here on the aerial map. The site plan submitted shows that they're requesting a landscape buffer variance uh, in this a, commer a CL, Commercial Limited Zoning District, as they prepare to... Um, construct their auto parts retail store just up against a residentially zoned property, thus the buffer requirement. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 561? Okay, will the applicant please come forward? State your name, address, and why you're here. Mr. Chairman, one last note. We did receive a late email from the urban forester whose input we value yes. greatly on this. Do you have that in your file? Yes, we do. Very well. Okay. Thanks, Bobby Dietz. 645 Swift Road, Kirksey, Kentucky. Um, I'm with the civil engineer, Bacon Farmer Workman, on behalf of O'Reilly Auto Parts. Uh, this project started several months ago. I started out with a pre-application uh, pre meeting with Steve Mishu at Metro Water. And in, and in that, uh, <coughs> that meeting, uh, he had looked at his maps and someone had made a note that there could be possible wetlands on this property. So they asked us to get it uh, delineated, which we did, and there's approximately 5,000 square feet of wetlands uh, on the property, primarily in the mode part of the, the lot where most people wouldn't think there would be a wetland. Um, the hardship was there's a 25-foot wetland setback associated with that wetland. So we asked for a, a variance to put our bioretention area in the 25-foot wetland variance setback, and we were given a deferral and they asked us to try to reconfigure the site layout, which we did, but have by you, doing so... Have you offered us any buffer at all? It's about seven feet. Um, so what we had to do was put parking on the side of the building, which shoved the building closer to the property line um, on the MS-40 side, and which requires a 20-foot uh, landscape buffer. So where is the landscape buffer that you're offering? It's going to be on that bottom side of the map there. We're offering, we're asking for a 13-foot buffer variance. So you're providing seven. Where's the seven that you're providing? It's going to be along the, the building and that front parking area. Okay. And so the, the RS-40, is there a fence between? No, but we're, we will put up a screen fence down oh, the Like a, a opaque wooden fence or of some sort? Okay. So our urban forester wanted us to ask, why can't you keep the existing trees that are already there? No, he, he's asking, why doesn't, don't the existing trees meet the requirement, I thought. Right, mm -hmm. okay. It's possible, I think, but because we had to raise the site up so high to, to comply with the low impact design, um, I believe our slopes are gonna get pretty close to the property line, so I'm not sure <coughs> if there's gonna be any trees left, I think we're going to be sure. great nearly to the property line to make that, that okay. thing work. Any questions from our architect? Other questions of the applicant? Do you have anything else to add? 
Um, I don't believe so. The only other thing is on the MS-40, um, what's interesting, it, you know, it's on a, it's becoming a commercial corridor in Jolton. Mm -hmm. And in the foreseeable future, I would see this property getting rezoned into uh, a commercial type zoning. Sure. Okay. Any other questions, board members? Okay, we're close, close public hearing discussion. I think as I read Stefan's position, if they still need the need, he was agreeable. Absent opposition, he was agreeable to okay. the variance. Is that how y'all read it? I think so, yes. Mm -hmm. Anybody have a motion? I will move to approve the variance request um, that is stated in the, um, I guess I can read it. The request is to put up a six foot solid fence, the south side buffer down to six feet. Okay, motion's been made, is there a second? Second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes. Good luck. John Michael. Our last zoning case. Mr. Chairman, this case is 2018-562, involves the property at 1910 10th Avenue North. Robert Whitelow is the appellant and one of the owners of the property. The request is for a variance from lot size requirements. In this, the R6, that's residential, one or two family, minimum 6,000 foot lot, uh, square feet lot size for construction of a second single family residence. The proposal uh, sketched here from the appellant from the recent site visit, the face of the property, view up and down the street, the view of the rear of the property where presumably the secondary uh, unit would be constructed. That's from the alley view. I guess we'll leave that one up. Uh, again, with an R6 zoning, your minimum lot size is 6,000 square feet. The rough estimate as to what exists is 5,600. The reduction of 400 um, is the request before the board for that lot size variance. Um, is there anyone here in opposition to case number 562. Seeing none, the appellant will have the opportunity to come forward and make the presentation to the board, have five minutes to do so this, regarding this, this property in Council District Number 21. Okay, will the appellant please come forward? State your name, address, and what your request is. Uh, uh, my name is Robert Whitelow. Uh, address is 3264 Woodpoint Drive, Nashville, Tennessee, 37207. Um, I'm requesting the variance for the lot size, of course, the um, R6, 6,000 square foot minimum. I did get a survey done, third-party survey, and come to find out I'm only 334, <clears throat> 334 feet too small. After um, getting it done, I feel like that uh, I can um, safely build the second house um, even though it is 334 square feet too small to meet all the other code requirements as far as setback from the alley uh, and distance from the existing structure to the proposed one. Okay, so what is your hardship that you need this lot size variance? Uh, well, I mean, um, like I say, basically the, you know, it's just the uh, 6,000 square feet uh, minimum as far as um, putting it on there. Like I said, I think I can, you know, meet every other code requirement necessary regardless of the um, 334. 334 square feet is probably, I mean, it's smaller than a two-car garage, probably more the size of a so one-and-a-half car garage. Uh, of course, spread across that entire lot, so. Is your lot particularly smaller than the other lots surrounding uh, you? Yeah, it seems like the 10th, the 10th Avenue lots are uh, just a they're a little narrower. They're all about, they're all the same deep. Yeah, they're on the on the Tenth Avenue side. Um, they're all the same depth as far as you know from the I mean, excuse me, length from the street to the alley, but they're just narrower. If you notice on the Ninth Avenue side, uh, if you see my little red there, the one directly behind it, it's um, just a little bit narrower. I mean, just a little bit wider, and it it meets. I think mine is thirty three point three three wide. And that's what puts me under by that margin. Okay. So what, how do, you, on your site plan, you have a privacy fence that goes behind the front house. How does, how do people access the second, the back house? Well, that's the thing. We, I haven't um, actually had an engineer or a, um, you know, a developer go in and actually take and divide it out. That's a um, hurdle I wanted to jump 
when I seen that I was short, I wanted to get this part taken care of first. Then, of course, after that, we'll get some guys in there and actually see how we're going to divide it out. But I hadn't uh, got an official uh, blueprint quite right. yet. But so what you're proposing, though, isn't what you are going to do? No, no, not saying that. What I'm saying is that what I can put the house in the back, I just have to, there's some small logistics we got to figure out. Like, say, front access, back access. Um, what I'm thinking is I could take, I could cut it up a little differently. I just, for simplification purposes, just took the lot and just cut it in half. But there's an existing house in the front, though, right, that yeah. looks like it's fairly new? Yeah, the existing house was built in 2007. I think for me, uh, sometimes we've looked at these where you may have a corner lot on the end of a street or surrounding property owners have the ability or sufficient size to build two lots, and this one lot doesn't. Uh, I mean, you... There's one letter, very general letter, that says they oppose the requirement. So you don't really have opposition necessarily. But I, in some ways, without some more figures about what those surrounding lot sizes are, it seems difficult to show a hardship. It looks to me like on 10th Avenue, there's a couple or three lots that have two homes. Is that right? Yeah. Across yeah, and it's um, down, it's uh, on the same side, down the way, there's two homes on one lot. Going um, down, mm -hmm. if you go down on the map, there's a couple of others on that same side. There's development on the other side of the street. Um, if you notice, on the other side of the street, the two lots there, those are newly built. They were built and sold in 2014, I believe. But... Um, there's all kinds of dual construction going on. I mean, even from the back porch, you can stand on the back porch and you can see dual construction on three different lots from the back porch of the house. If you go to the front of the street, there's dual construction on two different lots. You can just, that's just what you can see from there. I mean, if you actually, you know, drove around a little bit, there, there's, a, there's a ton of development going on there, a ton. Okay. Any other questions of the applicant? Okay, we're gonna close public hearing. Discussion? I wanna know what the builders think. The architects. Oh, the one. The. <laughs> the one today. Singular. Um, just looking at this image from Metro GIS, the lot looks clearly more uh, narrow than many of the lots. Not all of the lots, okay. but many of the lots in that okay. area. And so, I think it's a, an acceptable um, hardship that it's a narrow lot. And there's a small percentage of three hundred and I think six, approximately yeah. five percent. Third party survey, three hundred and thirty-four square feet. Okay. Does anyone have a motion? I will move to approve the variance re request based on the narrowness of the lot. Okay. Motion's been made. Is there a second? I'll second. Motion's been made and properly second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes. Good luck. Thank you. Thank John you. Michael, we're at the short-term rental section of our agenda. Wow. After only two and a half hours. Mr. Chairman, the next case to be presented is 2018-542. As noted, this is a short-term rental appeal involving the property at 3814 Catherine Street. Amber Rink is the appellant and owner of that property. After staff's presentation with regard to this appeal, we'll hear from the appellant. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 542? Seeing none, the appellant will have five minutes to make the desired presentation. Again, after we hear from uh, Mr. McBroom. But still come, come close. Okay. Mr. McBroom. Tell us about this case and how you heard about it and any other violations besides not having a permit. Good afternoon to the board. Um, this was a, a host letter. There was actually a short-term rental permit application filed on the 27th of March. Uh, the life uh, safety final um, was approved, but the fee was not paid. Uh, on the uh, 6th, it then, or excuse me, on uh, April the 27th, the application then expired. Um, April the 9th was the first online activity. Um, August the 4th, a whole cease and desist letter was sent. Uh, estimated delivery of that letter was uh, on August the 9th. Um, on the 15th, there was a hotline tip, which uh, also claimed that the permit had not been, um, permit process had not been completed. Uh, Robert Osborne, 
sent a notification of violation and posted a stop work order on the 17th of August. On the 20th, uh, Ms. Rink um, and Mr. Osborne exchanged emails. And on the 21st of August, the BZA <coughs> appeal was filed. Um, on, or, on or about uh, August the 26th, the ads were removed and the ads um, remained down at the reinspection date of the case that was opened and uh, so therefore it was in compliance and the case was closed. Uh, there was only the one complaint and it was for uh, not completing the permit process. There were a total of 27 documented stays between April and August of 2018. Okay, any questions? For and there's no documented evidence that they did anything wrong before they just didn't pay their fee? I mean, they, they weren't renting before they... There was no evidence. Okay. It, there, the first online activity was um, uh, just <coughs> shortly after the um, permit process was begun. Okay. okay, thank you. Let's hear from the applicant. Please state your name, address, why you're here. Hello, my name is Micah Sannon. I am Amber Rink's husband now, as of two weeks ago. Uh, thank you. Um, we bought uh, 3814 Catherine in October of last year, and it was a dump. And um, she turned it around. She's got great design eye, uh, with the intention of us living there together once we got married. Um, most of the renovations were done in March, and that's when I moved in, and we applied and approved for the short-term uh, permit. And then uh, April 2nd, we had the fire marshal come out and approve uh, the drawing and came and inspected the property. And uh, shortly thereafter, Amber listed on Airbnb. Uh, and this is where we had a whoops. I thought she paid for the fee and she thought I paid for the fee. And the uh, fee oh, never like got paid. The outfielder saying, I got it, I got it, I got it. And the ball drops in. <laughs> Oh, gee, sorry. Um, Done everything but sent Metro a $50, $50 check. 50 bucks. So we sent out all the letters that we needed to send out. And okay. I'm here. Questions for the applicant. What did you do when you got your letter from Metro? <coughs> uh, she, <laughs> she didn't get it. It was under a stack of junk mail. Uh, and then when she finally received the email, uh, we got it on a Friday, I believe, and both of us just panicked and started going through our email because we couldn't believe it because we went through all the whole deal. And sure enough, never got paid. We went you, through our bank Did accounts. you pull down the listings? Is yes. What she's oh, all, yes. All of them. Uh, pardon? All the future listings. Yes. Pull in there. Okay. Yeah. Questions of the applicant? Okay. I'm going to close the public hearing. Thank you. Um, I mean, this is, this sure. is yeah, I don't I have an issue with that. I, I think that, um, yeah, given that they have... Um, had two months without, almost without uh, renting after they figured it out, and it was just simply not paying the check. I'll move that the zoning administrator didn't err and that the uh, applicant is eligible to uh, uh, apply for a permit again. You I think you have to reapply for a permit on Monday. Okay. Motion's been made. Is there a second? I'll second. Motion's been made and properly second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. John Michael. And I think you do have to completely reapply again. Yes. Yeah, the nice. same paperwork that you had, you sent us, you know, update. Send us $50. John Michael. Case number 2018-554, <coughs> Crystal Bowersock brings this appeal regarding the property at 4892 Whittier Drive in Council District Number 11. This is a short-term rental appeal based upon operation outside of the scope of the legally required permit. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 549? There is. As a result, uh, staff will make a presentation to the board, then the appellant will have 10 minutes to make the desired presentation. Uh, the board would then hear from the opposition before giving the appellant an opportunity to come back on rebuttal if need be. First, we'll hear from Mr. McBroom on behalf of staff. Again, this was through a um, host letter. Uh, first online activity was June the 19th. Uh, there were three documented stays during the month of July. Uh, the host cease and desist letter was sent on August the 4th. Uh, estimated delivery would have been August the 11th, August 21st. The ad was removed August 23rd. The appeal was filed for the BZA, and there were no complaints and no other actions taken on this property. Okay. Any the, questions for The Matt? first documented stay was in June of this year. July. Okay. 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 Any questions for Matt? Okay. Thank you. Let's hear from the applicant. Please come forward. 
please state your name, address, why you're here. Hi, my name is Crystal Bowersox, and I'm at 4892 Whittier. That's where I reside with my nine-year-old son. I am a 33-year-old single mom to an amazing kid. I'm also a singer-songwriter, a playwright, a touring musician, and an advocate for people living with type 1 diabetes. I've had it since I was six years old. The average cost of having this disease is about 20000 a year. The average cost of raising a child with a dual-income household is quite a bit. I'm sure you have family. Um, I grew up very poor. <laughs> And I've worked extremely hard to pull myself out of an impoverished life and to turn the tables for my son. In April of this year, I became a first-time homeowner against all odds. I'm the first person in my family to have a refrigerator that dispenses ice and water and have a roof that isn't about to collapse in on itself. And it might not seem like a big deal to a lot of people, but for me, it's a daily reminder of the discipline and determination I have been able to implement into my character and my lifestyle to create success. I was once homeless, and I'm no longer homeless. Um, I heard about hosting guests on Airbnb as a way to supplement income and to help lessen the burden of mortgage payments. I have a spare bedroom, um, which I would, can I show them this? Sure. My hand-drawn floor plan. I have everything I need for the permit, and I hope you like my artwork. Um, I had the guest room, and I hastily listed it and I take full responsibility for not doing the research that I should have done. I, d I assumed because I was in Old Hickory, technically, that Nashville provision wouldn't, all of the, those requirements didn't apply to me, and that is my mistake, and I own that, and I'm sorry. How many times did you rent the? I think there were a total of five, five stays. Before you got, and then when you got the letter, you canceled all future? Yes, sir. Okay. I was booked all the way through December, and, um, my, my first guest was a deaf man from Florida, and it was a wonderful experience for my son and I. And the second and third guests were great. I had a total of five guests between July and August 10th, and I realized how much I offer and I, I enjoy doing this. Um, guests left great reviews, five out of five for every one. Uh, my calendar was great, and then on August 13th is when I opened the letter from Mr. Osborne. Um, and of course, I was very surprised, and as soon as I got that letter, I, I did everything I was supposed to do. I went to apply for the permit thinking that I had everything I needed, um, and then I was denied, and of course here I am at the appeal hearing. Um, I purchased the signs, I paid the fees, I lost the projected income from the bookings. This has been an expensive, confusing, and difficult process, and I've contemplated giving up and wondering if it's even worth being an Airbnb host, but I know that once this is, 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 once I'm able, hopefully, <laughs> to do this again, um, that hosting in our home will be one of the highlights of my life and my son's life. Um, I've been the weary traveler before, and I aspire to be a host that lessens the stress of the journey for others. Um, I'm asking you today for leniency, forgiveness, and to be allowed to rectify the situation so that my son and I can continue the process of, of obtaining the proper permits and complying with all regulations so we can host again. Um, I just want to say thank you for your consideration and time. Okay. Any questions for the applicant? And did you say you drew this yourself? I did. Very nice. Thank you. Nice. Coming from the architect. Very I'm, try nice. I'm trying to do it right. <laughs> I took a photo of it so that we can give you your original back. I hope a photo would be okay for our Thank file. you. Thank you. And let's hear from the opposition, and you'll have some rebuttal time after that, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Opposition, please come forward, state your name, address, and why you're opposed to this particular request. Uh, my name is Nathaniel Vaprin, 4884 Whittier. I'm separated by uh, one property. Um, I actually just have a, a question, first of all. So this will be an in-residence. You'll be... Oh, owner occupied. Okay, that's actually was my biggest concern. So uh, I didn't realize that. So, okay. Any objections? None. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Come back. Hi. Yeah, and actually, when I, I here's I, your encore. So my, <laughs> anything to add? I did go around and talk to um, most of the neighbors who have adjoining properties and got their blessings, their signatures. I did everything to get oh, the permit. Well done. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Thank you. We're going to close public hearing. Thank you very much. I, I, you know, again, did everything that they were supposed to. Um, 
and you know, to me, if you you only have five rentals, it's not it's just not a serious offense to me. Okay. Yep, and it was and it's an owner occupied one room. So I'll move that the zoning administrator did not err. Uh, the applicant did rent uh, without a permit based on the specifics of this uh, case. The applicant will be eligible to reapply for a permit two months after the appeal was filed, which is 823. So on October 23rd, the applicant can reapply for a permit. Okay. Motion's been made. Is there a second? second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes. Good luck. Thank you. Mr. Come Chairman, on. case 2018-553 is our next appeal. Fred Vaughn is the appellant and owner of the property at 900 Ireland Street. It's a short-term rental appeal. This is based upon operation after the expiration date of a previously issued short-term rental permit. So again, a permit that was properly obtained and issued, expired, operation continued. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 553? There is, John Michael. As a result, the appellant will have 10 minutes to make the desired presentation, and the board would hear from the uh, opponents to the case. First, we'll hear from staff. Mr. McGruden has the case for staff. This, again, was a result of a host letter. Um, actually, the, um, it was a Type 3 permit that was issued on the 27th of uh, February 27th of 2017. Um, the permit expired one year later. Uh, host letter was sent on April the 1st, um, estimated delivery the 9th of April. Um, after the receipt of the letter, there were two documented stays in May, one in June, five in July, one in August. Um, August 21st, there was an email exchange between Mr. Vaughn and Mr. Osborne. On the 25th, the appeal was filed, and on the 26th, uh, the advertisement was removed and there were no uh, complaints associated with the property. No other actions were taken. And no documented stay since the 26th of August? I beg your pardon? No documented stay since the 26th of August? No, sir. Okay. okay. Any other questions of or Mac? Okay. Let's hear from the applicant. I, I'm sorry, Mac. I did, I'm sorry. One, you said there was an email exchange on 821. Is there anything that in your records that that would indicate why that email exchange started. Um, I mean, if the letter was uh, the letter was sent in April, what happened between April and August? Or, I mean, did, was it did did the applicant initiate the email, or do you know, or did? Yes, sir, he did, and uh, I have a copy of the email here. Um, it does not indicate the reason that the email was sent. It just says. Uh, uh, Hello, Robert. I obtained a short-term rental permit and gave the number for the address and the date um, on which the permit was um, received and apparently was unaware that there were one-year renewables. The okay. That's the best I can come up with okay. from this. But yes, the uh, applicant did initiate the uh, email. Okay. Applicant, please come forward. State your name, address, why you're here. Hello, my name is Fred Vaughn. I'm located at 900 Ireland Street. Uh, I'm requesting a renewal of a previously granted permit to operate an Airbnb. I've met all the uh, requirements in the past to get the uh, permit. However, I failed to renew my permit, uh, not realizing it was a requirement. And then to speak to the part about, I have a P.O. box that I use for my address. This is my uh, primary residence but I only get like welcome and get some Pizza Hut coupons to my mailbox, so I never check it. So as of last year, October, I think it was of 2017, all mail was being sent back to whoever was sending me mail. So the uh, letters I, would, I never received, they sent me an email on August 22nd it was a copy of the letter uh, to my email address, and that's when I responded to Mr. Osborne, and he said I was in violation, and I immediately took the site down. I went in a couple of days later to reapply, and that's when I found out that I would have to come to the Board of Appeals to request uh, to reply again to get an Airbnb permit. So you don't you don't have you took all of the listings down, and and you just did you not know you were supposed to renew the permit or I mean you're not the first one to 
be in this situation, but tell me why you didn't renew your permit. Okay, that is two questions I heard. Uh, I did take it down, yes, and I did not know I was supposed to renew. And when I went in, uh, after I received the letter and went in, that was, we kind of joked about it. I have his name here somewhere. David Fraybert, I think is his name. And he was just like, you're not the first person that that has happened to. So after you, how did you receive the letter? Is that? It was through email. Okay. They sent it to my email address. Any questions for the applicant? I think so. Okay. We're, you'll have rebuttal time. We're going to hear from the opposition. Please come forward, state your name, address, and why you're opposed to this request. Thank you. I'm Caprice East. I live at 944 Ireland. I'm on the board of Ireland 28 Homeowners Association, and I have been there since the beginning of when that came out of the ground. I, I, bought, I purchased before the construction. That area at the time of purchase was marginal at best, and once we came out of the ground and took possession of the properties, we had uh, a security guard for six months. And one of the big problems was rental because we had all these area, all around the area was rental. We had to have abandoned houses torn down. We spent all kinds of time, energy, and money working to make Ireland Street the hip place that it is now. So now everybody wants to ride in on the coattails. When Mr. Vaughn purchased his properties, he knew that in the governing documents, we don't allow rentals. So when they, these, this group of houses were developed, there was a homeowner association that everyone is, belongs yes. to? Yes. And, and, and that's we, still in place? It is still in place. And the government documents have not been changed as yet. Okay. Now, we don't technically, this group of people here today, um, enforce homeowners association rules, but John Michael is going to tell us about how those are relevant to the process. Metropolitan Zoning Code that makes reference to zoning staff or the codes department more generally having anything to do with homeowners associations is in the unique limited um, application of short-term rental permit applications wherein an applicant, such as, for example, Mr. Vaughn, as would be the case here, has to sign off on an affidavit declaring that no, there is no HOA in place for my address that would um, restrict or forbid short-term rental use at this location. So if, in fact, there is an HOA governing document in place, such as traditional covenant, then they would either have to acknowledge that, yes, there is that, argue about whether or not it's applicable, or um, just acknowledge that, no, it is in place and I cannot do this permit. It doesn't happen here at the board. That's kind of the operative point it's here today. Just part of it, the board though. makes a point of uh, determining when somebody is eligible to make application for the permit once again. Right. Mr. Vaughn ba Mr. presently faces a one-year wait based upon his operation outside the scope of a permit. However, his appeal today is to reduce that one-year wait. Right. Regardless of whether it's one year out or one week out, it's merely a matter of he gets to apply at that time and the HOA question could potentially come up then. And so whenever he, if we rule, well, he'll be eligible to apply sometime, it might be a year, it might be less, but that's when he applies, that's when that issue will be relevant, okay? Okay, the other part that causes a hard hardship on our homeowners is parking. And I know that's like a Nashville, like everybody's got that but problem. Let's talk about this particular property. This particular property, if you look at the map, Ireland <coughs> is a one-way street, and there's only parking on one side of it. We do have garages in the back, or he has his garage actually is across the street from the newly constructed 909 flats. But there are not, that own street parking on Ireland Street, there are not 28 units. We have 28 units. There are not 28 parking spaces there just for our homeowners. So if you are a couple and you have two cars, you put one in the garage and you park the other one out front, we don't even have 28 for that. So parking is, is a problem. Um, the other thing is, is that this is a residential. It's not a commercial. And the, then I was kind of surprised by taking the listing down because if you Google 900 uh, 
Ireland Street right this minute, the first thing that pops up is NashvillePFSuites.com. It's the very first listing. It says Executive Corporate Apartments. So how can you not be well, owner-occupied and luxury short-term rental? Oh, short-term rentals. This is like yes, I said, that's anything. right there. It's on, it's current right this minute. Google 900, 900 Ireland Street. That's not me. I don't know what that is. You that's get your nine hundred. He'll have some rebuttal. Yeah. So. <laughs> so I don't think with the corporate apartment being listed with it that it's a single bedroom owner occupied situation. Okay. Um, and so that's kind of the stance of you and this HO. Are you on? Are you on the HOA? Yes, I am. I am one of the board members. One of three board members. Okay. Any other questions for the applicant? No. Thank okay. You, no. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. We're going to hear from the, uh, I mean, that was opposition. The applicant, again, please come forward. It's rebuttal time. I want to respond to a few things. She mentioned that she's, I've been at the property for six years. So I came in when, kind of like you, not as long as you, when it was being developed. And I think I put in my time trying to make it the best property that it can be. In fact, there was a time when our HOA could not do some of the upkeep that we needed to do on the grounds, and we were requested to assist there. The marquee, 28 Ireland, is front of, in front of my unit, and I paid for a landscaper to come and do that. So I am as committed to the property. The other thing that I wanted to do you do think there's um, what she said, what, what was what she said was correct or incorrect? That's the third thing. I'm going to get to that. Yes, okay. uh, that is incorrect, though. As, as it relates to the parking, 90% of the people that uh, come to my property <coughs> will do Lyft or uh, what is the other? I can't Uber. Remember. Uber, exactly. They don't drive a car. But then I have private parking on Ninth Avenue where they come right inside of my property. So that thing about uh, not having enough parking kind of goes out of the uh, out of the window as it relates to, this is my primary residence you can look at the deed of trust it's in the name of Frederick L Vaughn and we don't dispute that so I'm not understanding that's the first I've heard about you said it being corporate a corporate apartment or leasing I don't know anything about that this is my primary residence okay any questions for the uh, applicant or do you, are you familiar with the HOA, and does that apply to you? I want to uh, speak to that. In our HOA, we are we are we cannot do a long-term rental, but there's nothing in our HOA bylaws about short-term rentals. In fact, we have two other people, Aaron D. Turner in 904, 902 next to me, and Andrew Ostrowski. He has sold now 904 were granted permits uh, to be... Granted by who? The city. By... Oh, the city. Yes, yes. Okay, the city. Okay, gotcha. So there are at least two other people that currently have permits sure. in our unit, and then <coughs> there's two more that are operating illegally that okay. do not have a permit at all. So uh, you had a permit. You just you talked about the P.O. box, and you just let it lapse. Um, so you've you've taken care of those kind of things in the future where this won't happen. Yes, sir. Okay. I have. Any questions for the applicant? No. Okay. Thank you. Close public hearing discussion. And I mean, I I don't know that everybody would agree, but I would I I tend to view um, expired permits as being fairly lenient. There is some question as to whether or not you know I mean what happened between <coughs> April and and August. But I also think that had the applicant act, uh, everything that that, that, that uh, Mac and the applicant has said is that it wasn't rented after um, 825 when the appeal was filed. And I think that had uh, had he gotten the letter and done everything he did after that communication, I think the maximum penalty would have been a couple months. And I think that that's, to me, uh, already passed in terms of the application date. Okay. So I'll, I'll move that the applicant uh, did, um, the zoning administrator did not err, uh, the applicant did rent after his permit had expired, and that 
the applicant be eligible to reapply for a permit uh, on Monday and that any issues with uh, the HOA would be resolved within the permitting application process. Okay. M motion's been made. Is there a second? Second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes. John Michael. Um, oh, it's early voting. This is the sixth time this year, 2018. The residents of Davidson County are going to the polls. We will, old timers will be talking about 2018 in the future about, remember we voted six times in one year, so go early vote. Thank you Metro National Public Schools for allowing us to be here because our normal space at Sunny West is being used by early vote, which apparently is very uh, booming this time around. So. Um, we will see you all soon. Anything else to add, John Michael? We'll be back here on November the 1st of 2018 for our next board meeting here at MNPS. For anybody who chooses to attend or needs to attend for their cases, don't go to the Sunny, come to the school board. Okay. Thank you. So much. Thank you. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.